，投到静音放。但请不要忘记打开您的摄像头。三，在问答环节中，您可以在 Zoom 的聊天栏里写下您想要提出的问题。四，我们也要提醒所有的参会者。请您不要忘记填上报道表和表，以便获得今天会议的电子证书。我们的工作人员已经将链接写在 Zoom 聊天栏里了，请大家抽出一点时间填写。谢谢大家。Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the International Conference on Chinese Indonesian Culture Heritage, 2021. Organized by the Chinese Department and Center for Chinese Indonesian Studies of Petra Christian University. Is also supported by Master of Literature Program and the Architecture Department of Petra Christian University. The umbrella theme of this year conference is rejuvenating Chinese Indonesian culture heritage. 女士们、先生们，大家好，欢迎大家参加由彼得拉基督教大学中文系和彼得拉基督教大学印华研究中心主办。由彼得拉基督教大学文学院研究所和彼得拉基督教大学建筑系协办的二零二零年印印尼华人文化遗产国际研讨会。本次研讨会的主题是复兴印华文化遗产。First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Andy Yustina. A postgraduate, a postgraduate student of Master of Literature Program, Petra Christian University, and it is indeed a great honor and privilege for me to be your host for today's conference. 首先，让我做个简单的自我介绍。我的名字是 Ben Gilbert Angregunawan， 中文名字是黄延恩。我是彼得拉基督教大学中文系一年级的学生。非常荣幸可以当本次研讨会的主持人。Before starting today's conference, let us pray for God's guidance and blessing for this event. Dr. Julia Ekadini, the head of Master of Literature Program of Petra Christian University, will lead us in Christian prayer. 在开始今天的研讨会之前，让我们先低头祷告。求神带领我们今天的活动。彼得拉基督教大学文学院研究所的主任朱莉亚·埃加里尼主任将以基督教的祷告方式来带领大家。Good morning, everybody. Heavenly Father, we bow our hearts to you and give you thanks for all your guidance. Thank you that we are able to hold this international conference on Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage today. We thank you for all your profit. The year Petra Christian University celebrates its 60th anniversary. Thank you for keeping the committees, the speakers, so that all of us can have a fruitful conference. Help us to have a good internet connection and continue to guide us during the conference, so that we may serve your heavenly will in our discussion and in everything we do after the conference. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Next, let us sing Indonesian national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep your microphone in the mute position. 接下来，让我们一起唱印度尼西亚国歌。女士们、先生们
，请大家保持麦克风在静音状态。Thank you. 谢谢 Now I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our special guest, to the Honorable Professor Dion Tono Hajito, Director of Petra Christian University, to the Honorable Dr. Dwi Setiawan, Dean of the Faculty of Language and Literature of Petra Christian University. To the Honorable Mrs. Elisa Cristiana, head of the Chinese Department of Petra Christian University, who is also the conference chair. To the Honorable Professor Esther Tunjala, chief of the Center for Chinese Indonesian Studies of Petra Christian University, who is also one of our keynote speakers today. Also to our keynote and invited speakers. Professor Leo Suliaginata, Dr. Todd Jones, Professor Ho Shi, Professor Danny Wong, and Mr. Li Hui Han. And of course, to all of you, the participants who have joined us today. Hwanyingbidalajitujaotashue 印华研究中心主席也是我们今天的主讲嘉宾之一 李伟汉先生，最后也欢迎今天参加本次研讨会的各位参会者，欢迎大家。Now, we would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Language and Literature of Petra Christian University, Dr. Dwi Stiawan, to deliver a speech. Dr. Dwi Stiawan, the time is yours. 
。现在我们邀请彼得拉基督教大学语言文学院院长杜伊斯蒂亚万博士致辞，欢迎杜伊斯蒂亚万博士。Okay, uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me clearly. Good morning, distinguished guests and fellow patronitians. It is truly a joy and an honor for me to welcome you all to the International Conference on Chinese Indonesian Cultural Heritage. In particular, I'd like to greet and thank the keynote and guest speakers, Professor Leo Suryadinata from ICS, Professor Guosi from Jinan University, Dr. Todd Jones from Curtin University, Professor Danny Wong from University of Malaya, Mr. Li Hui Han from My China Roots, My China Roots, and our own Professor Esther Kunjara from Petra Christian University, and the President of Petra Christian University, Professor Juan Toro Harjito. Ladies and gentlemen, Stanley Kripner, an American psychologist, once said, we've been the benefactors of our cultural heritage and the victims of our cultural narrowness. I believe that this statement is relevant to this conference. Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage enriches the diversity of Indonesian and world cultures. It's also a vital part of Chinese Indonesian sense of identity. It is priceless and therefore we cannot let it go. Nevertheless, in, rejuvenate, in rejuvenating that sense, we realize that there is no one narrow identity of Chinese Indonesian. I believe all the papers in this conference reflect this spirit and understanding. This conference has been delayed for a year and has undergone a change of medium due to the COVID-19 pandemics. On behalf of the committee, I'd like to apologize for any inconvenience caused by the long delay and thank you all for your patient and continued support. Despite the problems, this delay seems to be a blessing in disguise. Because it is now done virtually, the conference managed to gather more speakers and participants from different countries and backgrounds. It also coincides with the 20th anniversary of our Chinese department and the 60th anniversary of Petra Christian University. This conference is held by Chinese Department and Center for Chinese Indonesian Studies in collaboration with Architecture Department and Master's Program in Literature of Petra Christian University. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the multidisciplinary committee members for your hard work and persistence. May this collaborative effort continue beyond this conference. On a more personal level, I'm very pleased that our Chinese department has taken more interest in academic exchanges and gained a certain standing among Chinese Indonesian scholars and enthusiasts with the bi bi talk program, Justice Just and this current event. To conclude, I'm wishing you all a smooth and productive conference. Thank you very much. Thank you for the warm, for the warm speech that was given by Mr. Dr. Dui Setiawan. On the theme of rejuvenating Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage, there is no narrow identity. Hopefully, this conference will run smooth. 感谢 Louis d i a w a n 博士的致辞
To commence today's conference, we would only receive the opening remarks from the rector of Petra Christian University. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Giantoro Hargito. Thank you, MC. So, very good morning to all, especially to uh, the keynote speakers of this conference, Professors Leo Suryadinata, Dr. Todd Jones, Professor Gosi, Professor Danny Wong, Mr. Lee Hui Han, and of course, Professor Esther Kunchara, yeah, all my colleagues from Petra University, Petra Christian University, the Dean of uh, Faculty of the Languages and Literature, uh, head of department of the Chinese uh, departments and masters of literature and also uh, architectural departments. Yeah, my special good morning also to all participants. Yeah, and other colleagues from Petra Christian University. Yeah, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Yeah, even though we are now in a very difficult situation, but yet we are still given blessings and opportunity to gather this morning to attend this uh, conference. Yeah. My uh, highest appreciation also goes to the committee uh, who's working very hard to prepare this conference and at the same time also to celebrate the 20th anniversary of our Chinese department. Yeah. Okay, the theme of the conference this morning is uh, rejuvenating Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage. Yeah. The theme itself is truly rejuvenating. <laughs> yeah, if I recall, I myself has a Chinese root. I was born as Tan Tiang Juan. Yeah and remained so until I was like six or seven years old, when there was a regulation for us to, I call it, to detach ourselves from our Chinese cultural heritage. Yeah. During that time, the, uh, my parents had to change my name into <laughs> Juan Toro, yeah? maintaining my nickname Juan, and adding it with the word Toro to make it uh, more like Indonesian name. Yeah, but of course, no meaning. Yeah, this is why I, I am what I am today, Juan Toro Harjito. Harjito itself was my late father's name derived from his nickname, Ho. Yeah, ah, this morning, actually, I spent uh, Especially invite my colleague, is professor from uh, Diponegoro University, uh, Professor Han Aili. If you are here, uh, you may raise your hand to say hi. Yes, sure, I am here, Professor Zantoro. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. Miss, uh, yeah, I especially uh, invite uh, Professor Han Aili. She is one of my inspiration. Yeah, she maintained her three names. Yeah, her three names, and uh, yeah, by working in a state university, uh, she does not uh, hide her Chinese Chinese identity. Yeah, so some of colleagues will call her by cheek. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Professor An Aili, to be here. Yeah, so my family belongs to what's so called Chinese Indonesian Baba. So my late mother 
used to wear kebaya encim with no kutu baru. So if you, you are Indonesian, you know what kutu baru means. Yeah. She used to have a collection of sarong batik and each pattern has its uh, specific purpose and meaning. So for example, when joining with a funeral, she used to wear a batik putian. Yeah. We spoke Javanese and I call my older, my elder sisters with Chik De, Chik Nga, Chik Le, yeah, and my older brother, Koh De. My father used to tell me the meaning of my Chinese name, how my cousins and myself were named. Yeah, in my, my, my case is Tiang. So once Bu Eliza uh, helped me to find, to find my, to write my Mandarin, Mandarin names. Yeah, Chen Chuang, Chen Chiang, Chuan, uh, I forgot. Chen Chang Chuan. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially for our middle name, yeah. And how I supposed to name my children later. Yeah, but unfortunately, I lost all of that knowledge. Yeah, especially on the meaning of my own name. Yeah, well, Lisa tried to, 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 to dig deep there yeah, to, uh, to try to, to help me to find the meaning of my names. Yeah, yeah. Especially, and the other thing is on how to name my children with Chinese name and even on how to teach my children to call their uncles and aunties, especially on my side, yeah. For my wife's side, my children will call the uncles and jiku, tuaku, ji e, and so on, yeah. But in my side, tante, om, nah. In fact, I realized the understanding of cultural heritage is a very important role in understanding our identity and to enrich our lives together as community. So in this view, I really appreciate this conference. So thank you, Elisa, Bu Esther, yeah, and all my colleagues uh, in the committee of this conference. Yeah. As I said earlier, the theme of this year conference is truly rejuvenating. So yeah, this year, Petra Christian University uh, we are uh, celebrating our 60th uh, anniversary. Currently, we have a total student body, approximately 8,500 students, and mainly come from Chinese Indonesian family background. Yeah. And yes, just information, Petra Christian University was founded in 1961 at that time also was aimed to provide a uh, opportunity for the Chinese uh, students yeah, to continue their study in the university because uh, to go to a state university, especially at that time uh, was so difficult yeah, for, for them. Yeah, okay. So to end my speech, I really hope that uh, all of you will have a fruitful time in this uh, conference for our non pretranisian friends. When the situation allows, please do come and visit us in person in our campus at Petra Christian University. May God bless you all. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Giantoro Harjito. The characteristic of Chinese Indonesians vary from their names, uh, address forms, and clothing. Uh, and rejuvenating is in a line for our uh, 60th anniversary of Petra Christian University. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start our session today, let us take some picture. For all attendees, please turn on your video camera. I would like to invite Mr. Alpin Gapman Matkali to lead us to capture the footage. 尊敬的来宾, 接下来我们要先拍一下照片。
为这次活动留下一些珍贵的回忆，请还没有打开摄像头的来宾们打开您的摄像头。下面请李志斌老师带领我们拍照。好，谢谢。呃，那我这有物业 ，there's。Uh, five pitch, and I will start. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, wait. Okay, uh, pitch two. One, two, three. Okay, and. Page three, one, two, three. Okay, and then page four, one, two. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for all attendees and Mr. Alton. Without further ado. 谢谢所有的来宾们。Without further ado, we will begin the first session of our conference. The keynote speakers for this session are Professor Esther Kunjara from Center for Chinese Indonesian in the studies Petra Christian University, and Professor Leo Sulia Dinata from Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, ISEAS. This session will be moderated by Dr. Lili Sulistio, a lecturer of English Department of Petra Christian University. Dr. Lili Sulistio, the time is yours. 接下来，我们将开始我们今天的第一场会议。本场会议的主讲嘉宾是来自彼得拉基督教大学印华研究中心的 Esther Gunjara 谢菊花教授，以及来自东南亚研究所 ISEAS 的 Leo Surya Dinata 廖建玉教授。本场会议将由彼得拉基督教大学英文系老师 Lily Sulistio 博士主持。有请 Lily Sulistio。Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to all of you. How are you today? I hope you are all well, despite this pandemic, which is still over and over. My name is Lily, and I'm going to be the moderator of this session with two speakers, Professor Esther Kunchara. And Professor Leo Surya Dinata. Before we start, let me read a, a brief a CV of the first speaker, Professor Esther Kunchara. Okay, Professor Esther Kunchara is currently a professor at the Faculty of Languages and Literature at Petra Christian University in Surabaya, where she has been teaching for thirty-three years. She got her master's at San Francisco State University, PhD from Indiana University of Pennsylvania in the USA in 2001, in the field of rhetorics and linguistics. Professor Kunchara is the founder of the Center for Chinese Indonesian Studies, which was established in 2011. <laughs> Christian University. Most of her research and writings are concerned with sociological studies, gender studies, qualitative research methodology, and Chinese Indonesian lives, cultures, and identities. She was once a visiting scholar at Central College, Iowa, USA, in 1993 until 1994. A research fellow at Cornell University in 2010, she has also done several presentations in numerous national and international conferences. This morning, she is going to present 
a speech entitled Preserving Chinese Indonesian Cultural Heritage. Professor Esther Kuncara, you have 20 minutes for this session. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction, uh, Ibu Lili. And also good morning for everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, our friends who are attending this conference. I'm very happy to be able to talk with you this morning, although in a very short time. And I feel honored to be uh, invited to talk about this, especially together with uh, Professor Leo Surya Dinata. Uh, let me uh, present my paper first. And you all see that? Uh, hope yes, ma'am. So uh, the title of my presentation is about preserving Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage. And um, of course, I probably am not a, an expert in talking about cultural heritage. Anyway, when I work with the Chinese Indonesian Study Center, then I feel like this is one of the things that we have to also take care of. And we have also pay attention to the issue of what is it that we have to do in order to preserve the Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage. First of all, I want to a little bit cite uh, from the UNESCO World Heritage Program that, uh, that, that was established in 1972. So it's not very long, not even one century. Uh, in Paris, on the 16th of November, 1972. At that time, they recognized, they tried to recognize sites of outstanding universal value, which are part of the heritage of humankind deserving protections and transmissions to the future generations. So at that time, they, people think about mostly in the natural heritage or in the tangible cultural heritage that they want, uh, they want to uh, put it in an issue that is important for us to discuss. From that, uh, from several of the, of the meetings that they have, they have been noted, noted from 193 countries participated in the committee of UNESCO. They have been World Heritage noted, including 832 monuments of cultural heritage, 206 monuments and natural heritage, 35 mixed heritage monuments located in 165 states part, uh, parties, which have been adhered to the World Heritage Convention. So we can see th there that most of the cultural heritage that they try to, to uh, put into the attention are mostly the tangible cultural heritage. UNESCO World Heritage Education Program was uh, uh, established in 1994. At that time, they called the younger generations with the value uh, to, to teach them the values of the world heritage, to inspire and strengthen their will to preserve it, and to help bridge the gap between school and society by offering actions to strengthen socialization process of the child. So they want to include the younger generations into the program. The Convention of the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage was not mentioned at that time, but it was adopted later on in the third 
32nd session of the General Conference of the UNESCO meeting in Paris in October 2003. They recognized the invaluable role of the intangible cultural heritage as a factor of bringing human beings closer together and to ensure exchange and understanding among them. So the intangible cultural heritage was put into uh, the UNESCO uh, attention only after the tangible one in 2003. Why is the intangible cultural heritage considered to be important too? Before that, they have, they have not included this into uh, the UNESCO uh, issue. To raise, uh, because intangible culture is to raise the awareness of the local, national, international levels of the importance of this uh, intangible cultural heritage. They also, uh, it's important to ensure mutual appreciation among differences, which is often neglected before. To recognize cultural diversity and respect for the contribution of all historical periods of every culture and religion, including those who are a minority in a country. This is something very important to see that the minority in a, in a country is usually ignored or neglected, or they are not seen from what is important to the world. They are mostly from big countries and from the power country, powerful countries. Okay. The next is to provide for international cooperation and assistance so that people can help each other and cooperate each other to safeguard the traditional cultures of ethnic minorities whose cultural heritage is at greater risk due to their smaller populations and the lack of political influence, minority people often face difficulties in achieving their goals, especially with respect to maintaining their own languages and culture. This is the reasons why they feel that the, the intangible cultural heritage is something that is very important, especially to those who is a minority in a country. And Indonesia, we, we, we want, I want to, to see a little bit about Indonesia as a multicultural uh, state. We have a population of over 270 million people. And Java is the most populous island in Indonesia, but only owns 7% of the land area. And the, the, the rest of uh, and the population is 45% from the total population of Indonesia. They have more than 700 languages, approximately also more than 300. Some even say more than 400 different ethnic groups. Chinese as one of the ethnic groups is only 1.20% in the population. This is according to Ananda uh, publications in 2015. And that survey was, uh, was uh, done in 2010. So, uh, but according to Chalmers, this is the only ethnic group, the minority in Indonesia who has no uh, who, who don't possess any home region. Not like, for instance, uh, if you say Java, uh, I'm from West Java, and then they know, oh, they are from West Java. And uh, what ethnic are you? Oh, I'm Ambon. Then we know they are from Ambon. And who, uh, if you are someone, uh, who are you? I'm a, a Pataknis. Then we know they are from North Sumatra. But what is your ethnic group? You say, I am Chinese Indonesian, but where are you from? We can be from everywhere in Indonesia. And uh, I want to also try to, uh, to cite a little bit about Chinese Indonesian as an ethnic minority in Indonesia. Let's see, under the Dutch colonial period, Chinese Indonesians were considered 
foreign orientals, separated from the indigenous communities. Then Chinese were a kind of essential outsiders during the colonial era. They were used to fill the intermediary roles between the Dutch and the indigenous. After Indonesian independence, 1945, Sukarno sought to incorporate Chinese like every other ethnicity into a diverse national community. However, the sporadic and anti-Chinese riots still happened a lot in Indonesia during Sukarno. Until 1965, with the uh, movement, the 30th September movement in 1965, the Kudeta, Suharto banned any form of Chinese related activities including Chinese school celebrations and customs. After, let's go over after 32 years of Suharto era. In 1998, we know that is the era of reformacy. The rage against Suharto was turned against the Chinese in Jakarta, Solo, and many other places. Many Chinese people's houses were burned damaged, women were raped, and many left Indonesia. The next presidents after Suharto tried to dismantle official discriminatory measure against Chinese Indonesians by giving them a lot of uh, the, the cultural, uh, the traditions back to them. Several Chinese Indonesian organizations were also established. Chinese celebrations are revived. The learning of Mandarin is offered to schools, institutions, including Petra as open. Finally, we opened the Chinese department who is uh, hosting this conference now. Yet the census of Chinese population in Indonesia, according to Ananta again, and, uh, and this one, I took it from Ray Anthony Ray declined steadily from approximately 2% in 1930 to 1.14%. This is written by Reid in 2009, okay. And if I see some other, other sources, it is also around this, like Ananta also says 1.2%. Okay. And this is something, something interesting actually to try to see what is going on? Why is it that the Chinese Indonesian population is decreasing? Uh, maybe we can talk about, about that a little bit, uh, a little bit, maybe uh, let me go back to that. Uh, why is it? According to uh, Ananta, uh, they, they found something very interesting about this is that uh, many of the Chinese Indonesian during the survey, when they were asked of the ethnicity, most of them no longer say that they have a Chinese origin. Most of them would say that they are Indonesian. That is one of them. And another pro possible reason is probably that there are many of the Indonesian also, uh, Chinese Indonesian also who are living in Indonesia during the riots, during the reformacy, 1998 and so on. So this is something I think very interesting to see. Uh, now the intangible cultural heritage that are threatened to, to, uh, for extinction, for instance, are oral tradition. The oral tradition uh, in most of the Asian, Asian nations, Asian countries, is getting more uh, and more uh, left behind, okay? But that is also something important that uh, we, don't, we don't see it now. Uh, traditional ceremonies, all kinds of ceremonies, not just marital ceremonies. Minor communities like the Samin Society, Papuan people, Chinese Indonesians, these are all the, mi uh, the minor communities that is also uh, de decreasing and also the uh, 
the intangible culture is often uh, forgotten. Language is spoken by small communities and traditional games for kids and so on and so on. But in terms of Chinese Indonesians, we also see a lot of culinary, Chinese Indonesian culinary also uh, were forgotten. Uh, I, once I saw a, a book that say something like, they, they found a, a recipe book of Chinese, Chinese culinary in the past, uh, during 19, 1990s, uh, early 1990s. And so they were amazed to see that all the recipes are not, no longer, no longer uh, practiced now. And why is that? So they, they uh, when they asked the older generation, they said, oh yeah, I remember that, that was very nice. But now people don't use that anymore. Uh, don't cook that anymore. Uh, Chinese Indonesian hybrid language also is something that we can learn about how the, the, the language of the Chinese Indonesian is evolving until now. Chinese Indonesian traditional rituals, that also is something that uh, we can see in the intangible cultures of the Chinese Indonesian and a lot more uh, than that. Now, uh, I want to, uh, to show some of, of the achievements also accomplished by the Chinese Indonesian. Uh, sometimes also they are rarely been exposed in sport, for instance, badminton, in arts, literature, batik, in uh, the batik design, for instance, you have okpi, batik enchim, and so on. Culinary, medical treatment. We have, uh, uh, in the, uh, now we still have Dr. Lee, the Dr. Apung, uh, Dr. Un, uh, already passed, but also she is a very famous uh, doctor in uh, Java. Um, and then we have several hospital also that are built by the Chinese uh, Indonesian in the past. We call Tionghoa Iwan, Yang Seng Yi, and so on. And in literature, we have Wei Yang Jing, and so on. So all these, uh, all these uh, achievements that are made by the Chinese Indonesians, uh, but most of them are forgotten. And also in politics, we have Xiao Kyokchan, we do that. Arif Budiman just passed away, uh, and Pei is the dog. So this is just uh, to show a little bit of uh, what is happening with the Chinese Indonesian uh, here. Then I want to, to show this, and I want to credit this to Pak Udaya, who happens to show a lot about uh, the past of the Chinese, the life of the Chinese Indonesian, and then Pak Didi Kuarta also, and several others, of, of course, that, uh, that has enlightened uh, us to see that, although what we, what we want to, what we see actually is something that still need to be proven, uh, that still need to be, to be, uh, find, uh, to find out about how how uh, that is going. For instance, this is the Sumpah Pemuda one. Uh, we have, we see the, the certificates and we see the names of the, of the Chinese society. And then this is in politics and those also in the uh, Indonesia Raya. There's also one, one Chinese guy who is also uh, take a role in that. And of course, this is about Kartini who happens to also uh, say something about Chinese Indonesians, and this is the old uh, uh, newspaper of Sinpo, which also talks a lot about Chinese Indonesian, of course, culinary. And then we have the Kebaya, this is in Bangka Blitung, how the Chinese uh, also together with the local people uh, working. This is uh, Chong Afi, uh, who owns the mansion in North Sumatra. Uh, Sumatra. And of course, this is the famous uh, Han ancestral house in, in Surabaya. We also have the uh, the Te, the Te and the, uh, the, the Chua. And of course, this 
are the tangible and also intangible uh, heritage that uh, can be considered as our Chinese Indonesian heritage. And all of this, thanks to the webinars, a lot of webinars during the pandemic, that let us see all these things that we, we did not see before, some of them, and maybe most of, most of us see only a little, a little bit or heard a little bit of here and there, but they are things. This is just a little bit also. There are several more that I, I cannot put everything uh, here. So calling young people for the preservation of our heritage, again from the UNESCO. Heritage can be tangible and intangible, natural and cultural, movable and immovable. It can also be documentary assets inherited from the past and transmitted to future generations due to the in irreplaceable value. The term heritage has evolved considerably over time, initially referring exclusively to the monument, monumental remains of culture. Gradually, it expands to embrace the living culture, the contemporary expression, and so on. As a source of identity, heritage is a valuable factor for empowering local communities and enabling vulnerable groups to participate fully in social and cultural life. It can also provide time-tested solutions for conflict prevention and reconciliation. Quoted from UNESCO Heritage Site. What about Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage then? As a minority, Chinese Indonesian population are decreasing in number. Eventually, Chinese Indonesian could be fully integrated into Indonesia. This is just a prediction because it's increased, uh, it's decreasing, and the population in Indonesia is, uh, is very multicultural and they are intermarried, a lot of in, uh, inter ethnic marriage, and so on. So, so we can predict that eventually all the Indonesian would say I'm Indonesian rather than saying something about your form of ethnicity. I don't know what will, uh, this thing will happen. Okay. The long history of the life of Chinese Indonesians in Nusantara need to be noted and preserved for the future generations to learn. As young generations today, we are called to find ways Okay, because the young generations are good at IT, I think they are find good ways to preserve the tangible as well as, as, well as intangible Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage as our valuable inheritance for the future generations. I'm glad that Pak Liu, uh, Professor Liu Suryadinata is here. And I, I know that uh, Professor Liu will be able to talk more about this after me. Yeah, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, Pak Liu, uh, that I have to, to say this first. Okay, I think that's all from me. Thank you. Terima kasih. Xie xie. Thank you very much, Bu Esther. That is very interesting uh, topic. Um, now, we go to the second speaker. Uh, Professor Dr. Leo Suryadinata. Pak Leo Suryadinata is currently visiting near Velo, ICSU of Ishak Institute in Singapore, and professor uh, at Rajaratman School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University, NTU. He served as director the Chinese Heritage Center, Singapore, 2006 until 2013. And he was a professor in the Department of Political Science, National University of Singapore, before joining NTU. He was also president of the International Society for the Study of Chinese Overseas, 2007, until 2013. He has published extensively on ethnic Chinese in South 
East Asia and China, Asian relations. His latest book is The Rise of China and the Chinese Overseas, 2017. He is also the editor in chief of three volume Tionghoa Dalam Keindonesiaan. In September 2018, he received a cultural award from Indonesia for his contribution to the study of Chinese Indonesia. Pak Leo Surya Dinata will give a speech entitled Understanding Chinese Indonesian Cultural Heritage. Professor Leo Surya Dinata, you have 20 minutes to present. The floor may is I, yours. Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, may you help me to show the slide, please? Do you okay. have the slide, my slide over there? Okay. Uh, Alvin, I will uh, yes. show, ma'am. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. Um, sure, Pa. Thank you very much, um, Bu Lili. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, I uh, first of all, I would, would like to express my sincere thanks to the committee, to the conference committee, especially Bu Esther Kunchara for inviting me to participate in the conference. In fact, when we talk about this uh, Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage, you know, this is a long story. We are talking about history. However, when we talk about culture, in fact, it means it is the totality of all human activities. Nevertheless, in my presentation, I would like to be more concrete here. What do we really mean by Chinese, uh, Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage? As all of us know, as far as uh, the Chinese are concerned, they have been in Indonesia for at least several hundred years. The Chinese migrated and gradually settled down and eventually became Indonesian. When the Chinese migrated, Chinese culture also migrated. This reminds me of a very good book edited by Claudine Salmon, a very, a very good French scholar. The title of the book was called Literary Migrations. In this particular book, she examines the migrations of classical and traditional Chinese fiction to the Far East as well as Southeast Asia. Of course, it also includes Indonesia. When talking about Indonesia, she was arguing that the Chinese fiction, the traditional fiction, have been translated into Bahasa Melayu or later known as Melayu Tionghoa and become part of the local literary scenes. In Indonesia, it is always, the, it is most, mostly known as the Pranakan literature. This in Bahasa Indonesia. Many of us already know that Trita Samko, the, what do you call the Romance of Three Kingdoms, Songkang, Sungjiang, is one of the major characters in, the, in Sui Hu Zhuan, Batas Air, or All Men Are Brothers. And then also a lot of Trita Silat, the, the, the so called Kung Fu novels. But most interesting, perhaps, is the Sampak Engtai. This is Liang Sanpo, Yu Zhu Engtai. 
the Sampek Engtai had been translated into not only Bahasa Melayu Tionghoa, but also into Maduris, Balinese, and Javanese. In fact, it has really become part of the local literary landscape. Of course, as we mentioned earlier, these uh, Chinese migrated to Indonesia, the culture also migrated to Indonesia. The culture, of course, is not confined just to literature. You also have culinary, this is food and cuisines. A lot of Chinese food, like bakmi baso, baso tahu, bakwan, bakmi goreng, tauge goreng, lontong capome, kue lapis, and so forth. These are supposed to be the Peranakan foods, but it has been it it has been accepted as the Indonesian food as well. Next, please. And these, in fact, are the Peranakan Chinese food. Most of the people would, would agree with that. And in Indonesia, when the Chinese migrated, they no longer maintained the culture, the complete culture of the Chinese in mainland China. They have been transformed into the Pranakan communities. Why did this happen? I think uh, prof, uh, many scholars like Professor William Skinner and others uh, investigate, investigated uh, the emergence of the Pranakan Chinese society. It has something to do with the early migrants. Most of the migrants were male. Why so? Because at that particular time, uh, there was law which prohibited the Chinese from migration. There was difficulty, you know, in in, in uh, what do you call transportation, and also very few Chinese women came to Southeast uh, Southeast Asia, uh, including Indonesia. Therefore, the Chinese migrants they married local women, and the springs of sorry the offsprings of this mixed marriage later developed into a kind of hybrid community. It's called Pranakan Chinese community. What are the characteristics of the Chinese Pranakan communities here? Most of the Pranakans, they have lost the active commands of the Chinese language. And the medium of communication, in fact, is the local language of Bahasa Melayu. In addition to this, even the newspapers that they published were the Pranakan Chinese newspapers in Bahasa Indonesia. And these Pranakan communities, having a special type, a, a hybrid type of the culture was quite stable. And most of the new migrants, they were absorbed into the Pranakan communities. Next, please. However, the situation changed. Next, please. Next slide, please. But the um, situation changed. At the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. No, uh, can we go back to the previous one, the Toto communities? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah. In the at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th centuries, there were a lot of migration from China. It was due to the pull factors, you know, because there were more opportunities in Indonesia. But equally important, it has something to do with the law as well. The law 
prohibiting the Chinese from migrating were already lifted. And then transportation systems was improved and more Chinese women came to Southeast Asia, especially Indonesia. So because of the massive numbers of the new migrants, uh, it is called Sing, Singhe or Singhe, uh, new guests. Uh, it is known in Bahasa Indonesia as Totoks. So the Totoks are no longer absorbed into the Pranakan communities and they form their own community, later known as the Totok communities. This Totok the communities is quite interesting here, it is quite different from the Pranakan because they still speak the Chinese language. And then in terms of their culture, it is still uh, Chinese, unlike the Pranakan, which was a mixture. And they were able to sustain the cultural identities of the Chinese through what we know as the three cultural pillars, namely the Chinese organization, Chinese medium schools, and Chinese culture. And their identities uh, is quite different from that of the Chinese identity. The Chinese Pranakan identity is what I mean. Therefore, in the 1950s and the 1960s, you can easily identify that there are two Chinese communities living side by side. One was the Pranakan Chinese community. The other type was the Totok Chinese communities. However, Indonesia was in the process of nation building. Therefore, the Chinese were also searching for this sort of national identity. It seems to me that the Pranakan Chinese were identified, were identified with the Indonesian nation. In, uh, if you recall that in 1954, there was a major Pranakan organization called Bapraki, which was Indonesia orient, oriented, which encouraged the Chinese Indonesian to be the citizens of Indonesia. In 1963, even Sukarno in one of the, in the Bapurki Congress, um, he delivered a very interesting speech in which he stated that as far as the Indonesian nation was concerned, the Bangsa Indonesia, it consists of various suku. He mentioned suku Jawa, Suku Bali, Suku Madura, Suku Sunda, Suku Batak. But last but not least, it was Suku Pranakan Tionghoa. He used the term Suku Pranakan Tionghoa, not Suku Tionghoa. Indirectly, one can argue that as far as the Pranakan Chinese are concerned, it has become an Indonesian suku, you can stay as a suku, you do not really have to be assimilated. Next, please. However, the situation changed when Suharto came to power. Suharto introduced the total assimilation policy. He no, he no longer recognized no longer recognize Pranakan Chinese as one of the Indonesian suku. Indirectly, both Pranakan and Totoks have to be assimilated to the so-called indigenous Indonesian population. And he argued that it has to be, or it had to be immediate. 
Not only that, he eliminated the three cultural pillars that I mentioned. He even introduced the name changing regulation, which really blur the Chinese identity. Worse that Chinese were projected as a negative image in the Suharto Indonesia. The 30 year rule of Suharto resulted in a rapid pranakanizations of the Totok Chinese. When the, the end of the Suharto era even the, eventually came, I would argue that all the Chinese Indonesian, with a few exceptions of the old ones, I suppose, have been pranakanized. They have become pranakan Chinese in Indonesia. The fall of Suharto gave rise to the multicultural Indonesia. Next, please. And there was also a resurgence of the Chinese Pranakan or Pranakan Chinese identities. However, because of the 32 years rule of Suharto, which, what should I say? Uh, projecting the very bad image about the Chinese culture, as if the Chinese culture is not desirable. And most of the Indonesian, including the Chinese themselves, were not aware of the Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage. I remember at that particular time, Dr. Randos Eddie Lambong proposed to me to launch a project on the contributions of the Chinese Indonesian. And in order to let the people know that indeed the Chinese in Indonesia have contributed a lot to the Indonesian life and it should not be forgotten. And all the negative images should be corrected so that not only the indigenous Indonesian will understand, but also the Chinese Indonesian themselves. So I accepted um, the a suggestion and formed a committee. The committee members are many. This also include uh, Didi Quartanada. And within two and a half years to three years. We managed to publish three volumes uh, on the Chinese Indonesian contribution. The book consists of 1,500 pages written by 73 writers. And there were all together 129 articles. I venture to say that this book covered almost all aspects of Indonesian life. Yeah. They include 35 areas, you know, from, from language, literature, business, economies, sports, um, culinary, what should I say, architecture, and so forth. You can name what you can imagine, I think, uh, which you could, you could find in Indonesia. And I, I would argue though, that a lot of the findings are very new. And not many Indonesian Chinese know about this, not even um, the Indonesian population. So with this kind of publication, we thought that we would be able to 
contribute to make the people understand more about the Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage. Unfortunately, this book was quite limited in terms of the circulation. I hope that more Chinese Indonesian would read this particular book. In fact, this particular book, you know, has been translated into a Mandarin. Unfortunately, it was during the pandemic years. So the books have not been uh, launched widely. It was published, I think, in Hong Kong, distributed, I think, in mainland China. Next, please. What I would like to talk about, next, next uh, slide, please. What I would like to highlight here is this. The Chinese image during the Swato time was so bad as if the, the Chinese did not make any contribution to Indonesia. Even politically, it was very negative. However, the findings show that as far as the Indonesian Chinese are concerned, they participated in the Indonesian independence movement, like Indonesian or Chinese newspapers, which were in Bahasa Indonesia, were read also by many Indonesian nationalists. When Indonesian nationalist newspapers were banned, they had to rely on the Pranakan Chinese newspapers. And the Pranakan Chinese newspapers also recruited or engaged a lot of indigenous Indonesian journalists. One of them was the songwriter of the Indonesia, Indonesia Raya. This is Supratman. It is also interesting to note, this I think has been mentioned also in many webinars, in fact, but not uh, recognized perhaps by still uh, indigenous Indonesian, perhaps they have not been able to see or to watch the webinar yet. The, the Chinese Indonesian, as uh, Wu Esther says, participated, you know, in the 1928 Sumpah Pemuda, the youth pledge. Not only that, the youth pledge, in fact, was held in a building on the 28th October of 1928. Uh, the building belongs to an Indonesian Chinese whose name is Si Gong Lian. And the building has been donated now to the Indonesian state. And even the Indonesia Raya, it was first published in the Pranakan Chinese newspaper, News Weekly, as a matter of fact, is Sinpo Weekblad. And it was recorded, I mean, the song was recorded also by an Indonesian Chinese entrepreneur. This is Yok, Yokim Cha. Talking about the Indonesian Independence Committee, in the big book on the national history of Indonesia, there was no mentions about the Chinese members in the BPUPK. It only says that there was four Arab members in the BPUPK. BPUPK is the what you call investigation committee of the preparations of the Indonesian independence. 
the historical fact is this excuse me there was only one Arab as a members in that committee but there were four chinese i would argue that as far as the chinese heritage cultural heritage is concerned it is very rich yeah it deserves to be recognized by the public i'm very happy that the petra university is able to hold this chinese indonesian cultural heritage conference to remind not only the chinese indonesian but also indonesian in general that it is important to recognize the indonesian or the chinese indonesian cultural heritage and more research need to be done in order for us to know better about this cultural heritage thank you thank you thank you very much Pro professor leo a very interesting speech uh, ladies and gentlemen i'm so sorry that we have a very limited time so we will allow only one question for prof leo and prof esther kunchara please you may write down on the chat or you may raise your hand and directly ask the question one question please there is one question to Lily in chat from Mr. Heno Pradana. Hmm. I could not check it out. Yeah. May I read may I read the questions for you? Yes, sure. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yes. Generasi muda Tionghoa Please. kebanyakan tidak berbahasa Mandarin, tidak paham budaya leluhur. Bagaimana cara meneruskan tradisi Tionghoa? This is the question from Mr. Heno. Thank you, Mr. Heno. Cannot speak Mandarin, so how to uh, continue our culture, yes. Chinese culture? Um, should I apply or uh, Abu Esther? Should I apply or Abu Esther would like to apply? Maybe. To reply? Okay, I think as far as I know, now it is very easy, in fact, for uh, people to learn Mandarin, you see. The courses are available, I think, and so forth. Nevertheless, I would also argue that it doesn't mean that if you know a Mandarin, then you know the culture of the Chinese or the Chinese Indonesian. You still have to know other languages. Because as far as the Chinese Indonesian culture are concerned, it is not really the Chinese culture in mainland China, you know. It is the culture, the Chinese culture in Indonesia. Of course, you need to, 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 to know, if you want to make, make research, for instance, you need to, to, to know Chinese, you need to know Dutch, you need to know uh, Indonesian, uh, Indonesian dialects, I think, and so forth. However, even through other languages like English, you would also be able to a little bit more. Nevertheless, you want to have a direct access to the Chinese culture in China, then you have to learn the Chinese language. For the younger generation, I do not think this is going to be a problem to study Chinese at all. This is in an era of globalization. See, one need to study more languages, you should not confine yourself just to Bahasa Indonesia and English. You need to know more in order to compete in this very cruel world. Is there any other question? I think no question in the chat. Aduh, ini aku salah apa ini, Nate? This video stop nih. 
Yeah. Yeah, perhaps I think I should also... Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor Esther Kuchara and Professor Rizzo Suryaginata for your interesting speeches. Ladies and gentlemen, let's up, give applause to both two professors. And uh, I will return the time to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Milik Sumpah. Video ini moro-moro mati. Video ini moro-moro mati. Bisa lopo aku iki. All right. Um, thank you very much. Uh, there is a little bit of problem before uh, the session. Hopefully, for everyone else, the connection will remain stable for the rest of the conference. And um, Professor Esther Kunchana and Professor Leo Surya Dinata, thank, thank you very much for the inspiring presentation. Hopefully, this event will become one of the ways to preserve Chinese Indonesian cultural heritage. Now let's move on to the second session, which will be moderated by Mr. Woody Kurniawan, lecturer of the Chinese Department Petra Christian University. The keynote speakers for this session are Professor Huo Si from National Center for Overseas Hawaii Research at Jinan University, China, and Professor Danny Wong from Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences of University of Malaya, Malaysia. This session will be conducted in Mandarin. Mr. Budi Kurniawan, the time is yours. Xiaomian. 让我们进入今天的第二场会议 下面的环节将会以汉语来进行。接下来的时间就交给布迪姑娘晚谈江安老师。好，谢谢呃主持人。呃，各位来宾，大家好。呃，很荣幸呃，这场呃主持演讲里，我们有两位非常优秀的主
啊，最近的一些想法啊，说一说。那首先呢，大概是这几个内容。一个呢，就是为什么今天会想到这个题目；第二个呢，讲一讨论一下印尼华语传承的一些特点啊，还有一些问题的讨论，还有未来遇到的一些情况。呃，今天这个题目呢，是李秀珍老师找我，呃，邀请我来参加这个会的时候，我就一直在思考讲点什么。那正好围绕着印尼的华语，呃，我们最近正在做一些研究，呃，一个是研究这个印尼华语的语法问题，呃，还有一个呢，呃，是跟刚才老师们也说到的这个海外华语的、呃、印尼的华文遗产的问题。呃，我们把这个称为海外的华语资源啊，包括这个有形的资源和无形的资源。我们在二零一八年的时候呢，啊，我们曾经到这个印尼的雅加达啊、泗水三宝龙等地，呃，访问了一大批的学者，呃，也呃在泗水的时候也得到李秀珍老师的很多的帮忙。那这是一个原因，在在这个我们在做印尼华语法。啊，同时又在做这个印尼华语传承口述史的访谈的时候，哎，想到了一些问题。哎，同时呢，也在二零一八年呢，哎，也看到了，也听到了，啊，潘文国教授的这个，呃，关于印尼的呃华语传承、华语教学的一些，呃，说法啊，引起的一些讨论。那这样的话，我们就得考虑印尼的这种华人的祖语学习啊，这个祖语就是，呃 ，Happy Language。它的到底是一语的还是二语的？那么这个祖语生啊，也就是 heritage language learner， 到底是属于跟一般的学习者有没有不同？所以我今今天呢就想从，呃这样一些方面，从这个问题来出发来讨论。那我们知道印尼的华语传承，它的历史是非常悠久的。我们嗯看到它最早的就是。呃，一六九零年的，在巴达维亚，也就是今天的雅加达的第一家私书名称书院。嗯，那在一九九一九零一年的时候呢，印尼又有了第一所新式的侨校啊，也就是巴华学校。呃，那这个时候他们的这个学校呢，都是用的，基本上是用的中国国内。刚才先生也说到了，是中国国内的这个母语教育的模式。那这样的话，它就跟中国的原来的教育呢，有很大的一致性。但是事实上呢，到了这个，呃，上个世纪五十年代的时候，印度尼西亚的华文老师们已经在考始开始考虑，呃，老师的在地化的努力。呃，这个我们在二零一七一七年访谈到这个傅福金先生的时候，他用了很多的时间来给我们介绍他当时怎么这个建设啊，这个印尼的这个华文师范学院。<咳>那当然，我们知道印尼的。这个华语传承呢，它实际上是有大起大落的。它大起的时间呢是在上个世纪的五十年代，但是到了上个世纪六十年代的时候呢，呃，因为这个历史的原因，我们都都知道了，形成了一个呃印尼华语的一个阻断。那一直到了上个世纪到结束啊，九一九九八年啊以后啊，印尼的这个华文教育呢，呃，才重新的再起来。那在这样的一种情况下，就形成了各种各样的。华语传承的模式，呃，包括这个主要的有很多的这个中文学校啊，我们也看了各地的中文学校，但是这些学校呢，呃，总总的来说呢，是一种比较零散的一种办学的一种状态，呃，模式呢也是多样，各个地方的发展呢是不平衡的。那在传承的参与者方面呢是非常广泛啊，我们各地的华文教育的协调机构，呃，还有宗教团体，还有家庭，他们也都在。参加这样的一些一些一些工作，呃，取得了很好的一些成果<咳>。呃，但是呢，我们在这个访谈当中呢，也有一个特最大的一个特点，我们觉得是什么呢？这个我们在这个语言文化传承当中看作分量很重的一个语言景观，在印度尼西亚几乎是一种零呈现啊、呃，除了雅加达，我们几乎看不到这个呃中文中文字啊。呃，甚至我们在泗水跟一些当地的华社的领袖在讨论的时候，这个我们说为什么不能这个做有一些这个语言景观，华语的语言景观，中文的景观，呃，但是呢，这里边可能也还是呃有各种各样的原因啊，等一会我们还可以再来讨论
那因为印尼的这个华语在使用方面呢，仍然也是非常啊多样的。它不仅仅是刚才我说到，在上个世纪五十年代之前呢，印尼的华文教育基本上是跟中国国内的母语教育是一致的。所以我们在呃做的时候已经看到了，印尼的华语实际上呃刚才先生也说到啊，就是跟中国的这个这个这个国家通用语言啊，通常所说的曼族语，在语法上它是有一致性的。这个王文豪博士他在。二零二零年关于四水华语法的口语法的研究当中有一个重要的这样的一个结论，但是我们刚才也说到了印尼的不同的地方的差异，实际上是非常明显的。像这个，呃，雅加达、万隆啊，这个还有这个三宝龙、四水，这是这些情况啊，呃，可能已经是这个华语基本上是已经是中断了啊，它就就没有办法。这个没有传承下来，当然也有例外。我等一会还要说，还有传承成功的，即使是在，呃，这些地方也有传承成功的。但是在这个昆甸和山口洋这个地方呢，呃，他们的这个这个汉语的方言在这里得到了很好的保留啊。不同的地方还有，这这个我在二零一三年的时候呢，呃，专门在对国内做了一些介绍。那还有像棉兰呐、啊、巨港。呃，这个在郑军二零一三唐根基他们也都做过这个介绍，但是巴旦跟廖岛的啊、呃，也我们一直也在关注，我也去过这个巴旦，他们也有不同的情况。像刚才说了，昆甸山口洋，呃，这个山口洋呢主要是客家话，那么昆甸棉兰、巨港这边呢还是有有潮州话。那这样的话，他们在呃，因为方言的这个原因，他们就把这个文化呀，实际上是有。有很好的传承啊，这是跟其他地方是不一样的，我们不能把它简单的等同起来。像巴旦跟廖岛，呃，这个因为临近新加坡，他们的这个这个 Mandarin 这个华语这一块呢，呃，也发展的也还是比较好的。当然，最近的情况有又有一些变化，我们也还在跟进。刚才说到的是地区之间的差异，在不同的代际呢，呃，实际上也是有差异的。以往的研究都是说这个。呃，第三代或者第二代，但是我们在访谈的过程当中，事实上已经有一批在第一代他就完成了这个转用。这个以前呢，我们注意的不够，就是这个我们在这个三宝龙访谈的时候，就遇到他们在第一代的时候，实际上就已经完成了这个语言的一个转用，他们就不会不再使用华语。但是也有呢，更多的还有一些呢，就是超过了三代，他仍然保持。那正因为这样，我们觉得形成了今天印尼华语多样性。呃，是值得我们去思考的，就是我们为什么呃有的传承下来，有的第一代呃就转用了<咳>。那除此以外，刚才说到了方言，那呃一些学者已经研究到了这个方言在各个地方的使用情况，像这个杨红云他在呃谈到在棉兰，就主要是这个使用闽南话，也就是潮州话那个地方的潮州话，那个地方百分之五十以。呃，这个这个闽南话是通行的，但是呢，百分之五十以上的人呢就会说普通话。那当然，这个呃这些研究呢，我们还可以看出来，在印尼的呃各个地方的在华语、印尼语，呃还有这个华语方言的态度，实际上都是不同的。呃，但是呢，呃，据这个郑军他的调查，可以看出来。呃，印尼语它在权威方面，在它的调查领域，对棉兰的华裔的调查当中，它的这个呃印尼语的地位，呃，这个权威性方面呢是低于华语，甚至是方言的。那这个实际上是跟嗯这个华语在棉兰这个地方的传承的成功是有关系的。呃，也换句话，也可以倒过来说啊，就是因为有了这样一种观念。在印尼那个地方，它的这个华语和方言的传承才能成功，这可以，这是两个连在一起的啊说法。但是整个来说呢，这个印尼华裔青少年的华语使用的这个，在二零一六年的这个调查里边，就是说印尼的青少年的华语使用是在走向低的，但是方言并没有明显的一个衰弱现象。而且呢，他的调查说，这个呃，在今后一个时期里边，他认为这个方言仍然保持强劲的、强劲的势头。那这个也是值得我们呃非常关注的。我对这一点呢，呃，这个最近这几年是特别的关心。而暨南大学的这个研究生黄愿志在巴旦呢，他今年的一个硕士论文里边也对巴旦的这个情况进行了调查啊。那那为什么会出现我们对印尼的这些认识不一致呢？呃
呃，实际上这个王文豪他在二零二零年他的博士论文里边谈到，这个西方人在定义这个族语啊，他们但是这个王博士他用的是传承语啊，我就是说的是族语。呃，西方人他在定义族语和这个族语者的时候呢，他强调的是共性，他忽视了这个不同的族语社区的这个差异。那当然，他也有自相矛盾的地方啊，这个。这些族语传承过程的结果当中呢，他们研究的时候呢，有重视的是个性，所以这里边也是很有、很值得我们进一步的呃去研究的<咳>。那我现在要讨论的是，<咳>想讨论的是，这个印尼的华语它之所以成为呃传承之所以成为问题，呃，那本身它是跟历史事件有关系，比如说这个我刚才已经说到的这个印尼的呃当时政府的族语阻断政策。啊，平常我们就说的这个三十二年的情况，但这样结果呢，这个阻断政策它在，呃，事实上，呃，在印尼的这个诸岛啊，这个当中结果是不一样的，于是这就形成了有一些区域完全二语化，有一些区域这个有华语，还有一些地方呢还有一些这个方言的呃保留。那这样的话，很有可能就给我们再来看到这个未来的这个呃中华语言文化在印尼的。这个再生啊，提供了啊一些参考。那当然，这个印尼的传承呢，还有一个呃一个大的问题，就是这个缺乏使用的通道，呃，它的使用范围是受到限制的，所以这也直接影响到我们所说的这个呃华语传承的呃效果。那尤其是族语，它是作为一种，我们把它定义为本身就是一种文化遗产。尤其是这一次会议的主题，呃，提出文化遗产的时候，就我就更有强烈的这样一种意识，我们应该把族语看作是一种文化遗产来提出来的。而且这个呢，呃，这种文化遗产呢，它可以是表现为是有形的，也可以是，呃，是无形的。那这样，但是呢，呃，它作为一种遗产的话，很大的很多的情况下，它实际上是作为一种象征的。那如果我们，嗯，重新思考这些问题的时候，我们就可能需要考虑。这个不只是停留在语言的一个交际功能啊，这个也要关注到它的这个身份啊，就是刚才先生也谈到的 identity 这个本身的一个建构，甚至呢，我们可能需要考虑的是要从文化入手，而不一定完全是从语言入手。呃，如果是从语言入手的话，我们可能没有办法告诉他们的身份。那那之所以出现这些问题呢，当然大家刚才我说到了这个语言景观为什么是零呈现呢？它实际上是心有余悸。那我们面临的新形势，因为时间我简单的说一下，一个呢，我们嗯最大的一个特色，今天这个会议实际上已经表现出来了啊，我们实际上是一个三语会议啊，有印尼语，有英语，有这个华语，那但是这个华校传统的华校呢，也正在发生一个转型，就是要形成一个实际上实际上未来就是一个呃三语的环境。第二个呢，这个这个，哎，这个这个低龄化呢还会持续。那另外呢，它的学习动机会进一步的去走向差异化，呃，学习的路径呢也是多元化。那但是学者们现在有一些学者，他们认为华语语言和文化教学呢是没有，呃，不需区分华语和非华语。我觉得如果从这个呃文化呃传承从文化遗产这个角度来看，呃，华语的学习，呃，华语和非华语是有明显的区别。这是一个图啊，不用看了，用时间。那我的我未来的一个思考是什么呢？就是呃，印尼的祖语教育在很多方面它是跟中国的母语教育不同，也跟一般的这个第二语言教学也是不同的。我们最近这个我一个学生林宇欢，他最近在研究这个影响海外华语传承的因素，他就从宗教、社团、学校、社区和家庭各个方面来考虑。那我们的一个想法是什么呢？未来在这个社区的日常交际和家庭语言的保持，应该是未来华语传承的一个重要的方面。所以，我们将来呢，更多的是应该从儿童做起。为什么要从儿童做起？我这里有一个实例，那大家可能都会认识啊。这里边中间的李国辉先生，嗯，他我在二零一八年访谈他的时候呢，呃，跟他聊了很长的很长的时间啊。他五个孩子都是在雅加达长大的，而且都能够。这个很好的使用华文，他的孙子呢也是使用华文的，所以我们来看呢，呃，即使是在这个特殊的环境下边，啊，这个我们的这个作为一种遗产的语言，它是可以很好的继承下来的。<咳>
。那未来呢？这个我想，这个足语传承呢，正面临着一场教育上面临着一场革命。一个是我们可能需要的是新型的老师，比如说智能人，还有学生咨询，或者是其他的。另外一个，我刚才已经谈到了，我们在教学当中语言跟文化的这种顺序，可能要重新考虑。原来我们都是从语言出发。然后再来谈文化。那今天这会议其实给我的启发也是很大的。呃，我们可能是需要用当地的语言来讲述他的身份，讲述这样一种文化。而且未来还有一个更大的趋势呢，就是家庭和新的学校，就是这个呃线上的一个学校。那我们需要在这个语言资源方面呢，就要做各种对象的建设，要改造出新更多的啊优秀的语言产品。嗯，利用这个。呃，科技的力量啊，来解解决我们学校或者其他方面不能解决的问题。那说到这些呢，都是要从这个实际呃出发。那最后呢，就是一个嗯，今天的一个我说的这些内容一个简单的小结。总的情况来看呢，印尼的华语的状况是非常复杂的，而作为一种文化遗产的印尼华语的传承，正面临着新的机遇和挑战。那我们也看到，今天会场也可以看到，作为传承人的新生代。正在成长，呃，那我们应该正视现实，跳出历史的阴影，从印尼的实际出发，呃，多渠道、多路径开展这个华语传承的实践。同时，我们也希望呢，是能够重视市场，呃，充分利用现代科学技术建设这个适合不同学习者需要的学习资源。那最终呢，我想做一个研究啊，我们一个学术研究的话，我们可能应该关注足语的利用、呃、发展和田野研究的呃成果啊，这是一个。参考文献，好，谢谢各位。好，非常的感谢啊，郭教授的精彩演讲。呃呃，不好意思，因为有一些呃听众想要呃让我把重点翻译成英文啊，我就呃我 I will try to 呃、uh, translate the some of the points that、uh, Professor Guo has、uh, has delivered in this、uh, keynote speech. Yeah. Uh, This presentation is talking about how we view Chinese as a heritage language, especially for the Chinese Indonesians.、Um, the Chinese language education is uh, usually um, uh, use, use, is usually use、uh, the foreign language or second language view, but、uh, we maybe can also consider the heritage language that we view. Chinese as heritage language, and as a heritage, as a cultural heritage, the how we、uh, pass through the language to our next generation is、uh, a challenge, and but also brought a new opportunity.、Uh, as we can see now, the younger generation. Are currently learning, relearning the Chinese language, this heritage language, and we also should move on from our、uh, from the dark times in history, especially during the New Order era, and we must face the current situation and be realistic, using various ways, various、uh, forms to、uh, develop this uh, uh, pass through our.、Uh, Passing the language to our gener next generation, and we must also、uh, be able to use the technology to support the Chinese language、um, teaching and learning.、Uh, I think、uh, that those are some of the important points from、uh, Professor Kuo. 好，再次谢谢郭教授。呃、uh, ，our next presenter, our next speaker is.、Uh, Huang Zijian Jiaoshou, ha, Professor Danny Wong Zijian. He is the Dean and Professor of History at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, University of Malaya, where he teaches history of Southeast Asia. His research interests include the Chinese in Malaysia, China's relations with Southeast Asia, and history of Sabah. He was visiting professor at Peking University in 2018. He was also visiting Yip China Fellow at Magdalen College, Cambridge University, in 2017 and 2018. Visiting scholar at the Hakka College, National Central University, Taiwan, at in 2017, and visiting professor at the Center for Integrated Area Studies, Kyoto University, in 
Among his recent publications are Lead and Grow, 115 Years of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce of Kuala Lumpur and Selangor in 2021, The Kinabalu Guerrillas and the 1943 Sultan Uprising in 2020 in Chinese, Chinese Studies in Malaysia and Singapore in a Global Context in 2019, one Crowded Moment of Glory, the Kinabalu Guerrillas and the 1943 Jesultan Uprising in 2019, and the Chinese Overseas in Malaysia in an Era of Change in 2018. Uh, today, Professor Wong will deliver a keynote speech titled Re-Establishing Chinese Indonesian Identity Through Museums. Uh, I, I will remind the audience, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, put the question in the chat. Uh, we will uh, discuss it later on the Q in the Q and A session. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Wong. Uh, Professor Wong, you have twenty minutes for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear clearly. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, let me uh, start by uh, well. I'm, let me remind myself that I got to speak in Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 首先我要感谢, uh, Peter La, uh, 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 Elisa Christina Li Xiuzhen Jiao the Yao Qing, so on and go like Chanjia Jing Tian, the Zemo Tung Yao, the Eager Yan Hao Hui. Number Wei Yao Kan Si, Han Jiao So, Zemo Hao the Jay Sang. Or Nemu 那么如果我们看过去的二十年也是很有趣的发展和事件那么我也想讲一讲这项研究对这个运动的动机和推动力的探讨就是我们要看这个impetus the motives behind the entire efforts 然后最后也是想看一看就是检讨一下这些博物馆如何贡献以重建印尼华人的这个身份认同 那么如果我们看华人在印尼的历史，我们知道这是很长久的，这是我们呃在如果我们记得在斯里加亚的时候，我们已经知道有华人来到呃印尼的这一部分啊，呃这个历史也是一个很丰富的一呃一个族群的历
啊，印尼华人对印尼国家啊的归属感其实是很强的。啊，我们也知道啊，华人也为印尼牺牲了啊，就是在抗荷兰啊、抗日和争取独立啊当中，我们也看得到啊，华人为这个国家啊付出了很大的代价。那么刚才我们也听到啊 ，Prof. Leo 廖廖教授所提到的松巴本木达啊，自己这个很重要的这个啊启发印尼的国度的这个松巴本木达，也是跟华人有关系的。那么，可是呢，一九六五年这个政变呢，却啊改变了一切。我们看得到这个整个过程中啊，华人啊就在。当中失去了很多的利益啊、呃、权利。那么我们也知道，在华社，在我们马来西亚里面，我们说华社有三个柱子啊、呃、，three pillars of the Chinese culture 啊、呃、，first is the school， 就是华华校、华文教育，然后这些呃都被关闭了。然后我们的这个中文报媒体也被关了。那么最第三的就是社团啊、呃，这些也被啊、呃、不能够进行了。全部都关闭了。那么这当中呢，我们也感觉到，在三十年内啊、呃，我们感觉到华人的认同也一直在衰退。呃，今天我们也听到呃 p r o f l e o 说，从这个多多的这个情况转起这个布拉纳干的这种情况，那么这个华人的认同的这个这个呃基础等等，都会啊、呃、都受到很大的这个啊、呃、影响。然后这个是影响了几代的人，那么这个情况呢，啊，一直维持到一九九八年，当苏哈多总统下台以后，那么我们看得到这个改革、改革开放以后，那么华人重新争取他们的这个呃权利，然后啊，我们也看得到在呃二零零年啊，这个古斯杜总统。啊，把华人再重新公认为印尼的这个民族，就是把它认为一个苏古，啊，在这个邦萨印度尼西亚里面的其中一个苏古，那么就开始了这个华人重新归纳印尼主流社会文化的这个复兴，然后呃，民族的维新，还有这个啊，就是从啊啊。呃，重重新再展红，呃，这个比较这个这个华人的事业。那么在当中呢，我注意到呢，其中一项的运动就是开设这个华人的这个博物馆，就是啊、呃，我们这个有华人主席的这个这种博物馆。那么这个这项的研究呢，其实不是很新，可是它也不多。我们知道，呃，在做这这方面研究的。啊，其实是不多。最先我们有啊，早期呢，在二零零七年的时候，我们有这个北村优美，就是 Yumi Kitamura 啊，大家都可能很熟悉这位啊 Kitamura 老师。然后我们也有啊，苏尔梦啊老师跟这个啊伊布米拉啊 Citarta， 就是 Claudine Simon and 啊这个呃呃、啊啊、欧阳春梅啊老师。啊，他们在二零一七年也发表了一个很重要的呃、啊、一一一篇论文，然后我自己呢也写了一篇论文，在二零一七年一个简单的一个报告。那么呃 ，Kitamura 老师呢，他就是最先提到这个呃、啊、华人啊怎样在这个印尼印华百家姓协会啊怎样去推动在这个熊德一啊准将。啊、uh, ，Bridgen Teddy Joseph 啊、uh, ，怎样去推动这个啊？ Uh, 为了重建这个华人啊的这个认同的时候，他们怎样去把这个啊、uh, 印尼华人文化公园啊、uh, 建设起来？那么过后呢，我我自己的研究都提到啊， uh, 这个客家因素，我所谓的这个 Hakka Chinese perspective， 因为。我当我们看二零一四年，当这个博物馆建立起来的时候，这批啊、呃、在推动的这这这批人都是客家人，包括啊、呃、我们的这个呃熊呃将军，还有这个李世莲啊、呃、先生啊，巴伊万啊马蒂塔，他们都是客家人。那么 ，Claudine Simon 还有伊布米拉的这这个研究呢，其实是看啊、呃、探讨这个东南亚的三个国家，就是马来西亚啊。呃印尼和菲律宾的华人博物馆的
这个发展，就是过去二十年这个发展。所以呢，我们啊、呃，我们先看一看啊、呃，最先开始的这一项的工作，这个呃，在博物馆开始以前呢，其实最先的工作就是把这个印尼华人文化公园建设起来。这是经过这个印尼百家啊、呃，印尼华人啊、呃、百家姓啊、呃、协会啊、呃，在这个熊德仪啊、准、呃、将还有一批华人领导宣誓者的努力之下，重新和重建这个文化华人文化圈子，还有华人文化的这个空间，把它建设起来。嗯、那么。啊，他们呢，这个花了很大的功夫。最先是去呃，去找了这个位呃，苏哈多前总统。那么，在苏哈多前总统和他的那个啊哈拉班基达的这个基金会之下，他们博博了一块地啊，然后就啊过后呢啊，就是在这块地上面建设了这个华人文化公园。那么我们也看得到啊，当时他们也受到其他的总统的支持，包括这个古斯托总统。那古斯托总统呢，啊，他就啊承认自己其实也是有这个华人血统。啊，这个选择这个啊这个地呢，其实很重要。我当我跟呃、啊、这个我去访问啊李先生还有这个呃、啊、熊将军的时候。啊，他们都告诉我说，其实他们选的这个啊这块地，最先是在那个啊大曼迷你印度尼西亚印度，就是这个印尼啊引述公园里面啊破了一块地。可是这块地呢，面对很多的问题，很多很呃是在多的问题啊。这个这种白天我们可能在论文里面可以写出来啊。可是呢。啊、呃，也有人说，我们给你另外一块地，希望你能够到那边去，可以快快建起来。可是他们也等了，他们也把这个问题解决了啊、呃，因为他们认为呢，啊、呃，如果我们把这个啊、呃、这个文化公园，还有以后的这些博物馆，能够建在这个印尼的这个啊，大、呃、曼印啊，大、呃、曼迷你印度尼西亚。就是表示说，它是归纳这个国家邦萨印度尼西亚的一部分，一个属骨。所以我在这里提一提这个啊，毕建啊，就是熊建熊熊啊呃将军所提的。他说啊，我用马来文先读一读，就是说，他们布达亚用话的，他们迷你印度尼西亚印达，我把干新博尔本阿库万，那个拉丹邦萨，阿达斯埃斯顿西。Suku Tionghoa warga negara Indonesia secara politik dan budaya dalam keluarga besar bangsa Indonesia. Cina itu adalah bahasa kita. Kita ini 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 adalah bahasa 这个是熊将军强调这一部分，就是说我们是呃印尼华人是国家的一部分，啊，然后在大曼迷你印度尼西亚里面，就是啊反映着这个啊这个归属这个国家的一部分。那么这些体啊图片，就是左边的那个啊这个匾牌，就是那个大曼迷尼印度尼西亚的啊啊不是，这个是啊这个啊大曼。Chinese Cultural Park 的这个呃呃大门，然后他那个呃他的那个呃呃图就是呃反映着这个整个公园的这个建设。那中间呢，中间那个就是在这个博物馆，这是这个圆形这个土楼客家土楼的这个博物馆。那么在当中呢，有啊，我们知道在当中有两两个馆，一个是印尼呃客家博物馆，另外一个是印尼华人博物馆。那么在印尼博啊华人博物馆里面，这一部分很重要，就是啊这句话说 ，Indonesia kepada mu kami berbakti， 就是说我们印尼，我们为你效忠，为你啊啊效力。那么在当中我们就看得到啊，在墙壁上就是这些啊印尼华人重要的华人呃领导。啊，科学家、教育家等等啊，他们的啊相片都在那边，表示说我们其实啊为国家付出了很多的啊
力量啊、呃、等等。当中呢，也有一些是做呃当当军人的。那么这个左啊、呃、右边呢，就是啊、呃、这个呃啊尤多尤诺啊总统在二零一四年。为这个客家博物馆开幕的时候支持的时候，所以的影像，所以你看得到这个围楼其实是很重要的。所以我们看一看啊，这是从二零零七年啊这个公园呃建设以后，到二零一四年当这个博物馆成立的时候，我们啊我感觉到就是过程当中有一有一个很特别的情况和发展，就是刚才我所提到的这个客家民俗。那么我们知道，这个啊，熊将军还有这个李世莲先生，他们都是客家人，然后他们还在还是在这个建设这个博物馆里面扮演了很重要的角色。那么这个整个啊，印尼科树联谊总会和他们的会长啊，苏根布兰南多啊，这位啊，叶里。啊，叶连理县会长，还有他们的这个客家领导，他们呢完成了这个整个的工程，所以呢，他们所选的这个就是以这个客家博物馆为本，那么他的啊建设是以这个永定福建永定的客家人这个围围楼啊土楼啊做成这个啊这个象征，然后印尼华人博物馆就是其中的一部分。啊，在里面的一一一个馆，那么这个啊，这博物馆是在二零一四年啊啊啊，就在啊这个啊总统啊开幕啊，支持开幕。然后我们知道这个客家因素呢，其实对这个使到这个客家呃，使到这个印尼华人客呃的这个博物馆啊，就感觉到很特别，因为在这个馆里面是其实是两个馆，那么。他强调的，主要强调的啊，我们所要看的就是他们的这个动机，还有他的那个愿望，他们所要他到的是什么？这两个馆里面，我们看得到他他们所强调的，主要是第一，华人是印尼的一部分，所以这个主题一直存在，一直出现。然后第二呢，就是印尼华人是中心以印尼的。所以这两两点，它是连在一起，就是我们一直看着下去，所有的博物馆都强调，呃，这两这两个主要的主题。那么，如果我们看这个馆的展示呢，我们可以看得到它有四个部分，四种啊、呃，四种主题。一就是印尼华人的历史，第二就是华人怎样为啊、呃、这个印尼的独立。还有建国啊，怎样付出的这些贡献？那么第三呢？印尼怎样贡献在建设这个印尼啊，这个独立后的印尼？然后第四呢，就是他们印尼华人的认同的建设。那么这个建设呢，他们啊，这个很特别，我也感觉到这个很特别，主要是因为如果我们到东南亚。我们看得到，华人都是以这个方圆群的这个认同以根本。可是呢，在这个博物馆里面所强调的不是这个啊、呃，你是不是福建人、客家人等等这些，而而所强调的是哪个地方的印尼华人？比如说，他说我是啊、呃、邦加布里东的，或者是我是新高旺的啊、呃，这个或者是雅气的这个华人，所以他是以印尼的每个省份的华人来做。啊，他的认同代表，所以这个是啊，对我来说是很特别的。所以呢，如果我们再看下去呢，我们啊，下一啊，除了这个主要的这个印尼华人博物馆以外呢，我们会看多可能是四四间啊，我只是选了四间来，大概就是做这个啊，做我们的这个啊，围猎来谈一谈。第一就是啊，这个在啊。当地人的这个华人历史博物馆，这个它的名字啊是叫做 Banteng Museum Heritage 的当地人。那么这个是由啊这位啊林先生林振鹏先生啊啊把乌达亚哈林啊在二零一一年啊这在这间啊房子啊建建立起来，这个是相当有趣的一间啊一间博物馆。
，因为他们强调不是单单啊华人怎样为印尼国家贡献，而怎样这些华人在当地怎样为当地人贡献给当地人的这个社会，还有对当地人的这个企业啊怎样有啊贡献。当啊，当然他们也在提了这个啊，这个布拉纳干 culture， 就是土生华人的这个啊，这个文化啊，这个困血的一部分也被啊，他们也提出来。那么我在这里就简单就提了一个是巴乌达亚哈林所提出来的，他说呢，华人历史纪念馆的创办，不单让子孙后代为前辈的事迹感到骄傲。更正视了华人是印尼民族不可分割的一部分，所以我们听到这一句话的时候，我们就可以想象到说，这个主题、这个想法，其实就是跟刚才博物馆，就是印尼博物馆的这个想法的这个动机，还有它的推动力，它都是一样的、一致的。所以这个对我来说是很重要的一部分。那么下一个呢，我们是看一个这个很特别的一个呃博物馆。他这个叫做啊，我我自己放这个名字就是印尼土生华人文学博物馆，它就是啊 ，Museum Pustaka Peranakan Tionghoa Indonesia， 这个是在啊，二零一二年啊，巴阿兹米这位巴阿兹米是从啊雅齐来的，他就开始建设了这个，这个是跟当地的群众也是有贡献，一起在合作建起来，那么。啊，这个博物馆是以书本啊，以啊这些出版的这个刊物为主啊，包括这些海报啊等等。可是当中呢，有大概是啊两万册的这个书。那么这些书呢是很重要，因为他们把他他主题就是华人怎样提倡啊，用这个印尼文或者是马来文啊所写的这个文学。那这个就跟一般的这个华人博物馆有所不同，可是我我想这个就很重要，就是因为这个布拉纳干啊，金纳啊的啊的这个啊这个布拉纳干电话的这个这一部分的这个华人经验也是很宝贝的，就是印尼华人的啊经验、历史经验的一部分，所以我们不能够否认的。下来呢，就是我们看这个是在啊，这个是在泗水，就在苏拉巴亚的这个啊 House of Sampurna Museum。我我找不到它的中文名，可是我们知道这是一家姓林的林森蒂先生的呃、啊、家人，他的后代啊啊建立起来的。这是呃、啊、他们这家人其实是做烟草公司的，这个印尼的这个 Great Day 很出名的 Great Day 啊 Cigarette。那么他们的那个啊，他们的来呃、啊、财财产的来源就是经过这个烟草公司，然后这个二零零三年他们建设了这个啊这个博物馆。那博物馆呢，其实呢这个很重要，因为他们当然是啊强调这个印尼华族还有这个家庭怎样贡献于当地苏拉巴亚还有印尼的发展啊啊，他们怎样啊贡献。这个国家，然后啊、呃，当中也是有一个画廊。呃，今天呃，二零零二零零五年过后呢，这个公司呢其实是已经呃被其他公司接管啊、呃，所以这个可是呢，他们还是保持这个博物馆的这个原状。那么下来呢，我想就提一提这个啊、呃，大家也可能比较熟悉的这个。啊，张氏的啊，在啊，缅南张氏在梅旦的这个张氏家住的这个博物馆，这是缅南张荣轩纪念馆，还有这个张阿辉啊，这个故居。那么这批这两个呃、啊、兄弟呢，他们是他们的博物馆，其实是代表了华人精英的这种生活的这个方式的这种啊展示出来。可是它的主要的那个主题呢，还是在纪念这位两位张氏兄弟，就是张永啊、呃、张永轩，就是张玉南先生，还有他的弟弟张红南，就是这位啊、呃、张张阿啊张亚飞啊张阿飞的这个贡献，对当地的这个贡献是怎样？那么我们知道这两位啊、呃、客都是客家人。
那么他们啊、呃，在十九世纪末期还有啊二十世纪早期呢，就赚了不少的钱。可是他们也是大慈善家，所以他们捐款呢，捐募了很多，建校、建了医院，还有建庙，还有啊、呃，他们也啊、呃、办了帮社会办了很多这些公务。那么他们的贡献，当然当时啊、呃、的这个印尼的那个荷兰政府。也呃也关注到，那么也把他们把，尤其是啊、呃、张永轩啊啊委任成 mayor 啊、呃，所以他这个就是华人领导的意思。所以这个博物馆呢，其实是还是为啊、呃、还是以他们家庭来保存。那么我们知道，其实他这个博物馆其实是有两。汪教授，不好意思，那个你的时间到了。啊，你给我讲到一点，就就要完了，就是最后两个 slide 哈、嗯，不好意思，这样。那么啊、呃，这个张阿辉的这个故居是在二零零九年开始的，他也是这个展示出这个布拉纳干的这个方式。然后第二就是张荣先纪念馆，这是比较迟开，呃，他这个纪念馆里面也有这个他们这个。啊，茂荣园，它就是一个他们的祖坟也在里面。那么在这里呢，他们其实啊，就是表示说这个是张氏的历史，可是他们也啊强调他们在当地的贡献是怎样。那么他们也呃也有在当中啊强调说他们跟中国啊各个政府啊，从满清政府到民国政府的这个关系，包括张荣轩的这个儿子张富清怎样成为了。啊，这个中国驻美南的领事，所以这个是很有趣的这个啊博物馆。那么啊，让我就简做个啊简单的结论。那么，当我们从这批华人啊这个推动这个啊啊建设这个啊博物馆的运动啊的时候，我们看他们的动机还有他们的呃呃、啊、推动力呢？我们是了解说，他们其实要用这个博物馆来重新再建设他们的这个呃华人的这个身份，还有保持他们这个华人认同。那么他们也是迈向一个我所讲想要强调的，就是这个在华化，就是 r e s i n i c i z a t i o n 这个 process， 就是重新把他们这个华人化重新再啊、呃、再找回来。呃，这是尤其是这批领导，我们都知道他们是过去三十年内啊、呃、失去了这一部分的这个历史，还有这个认同。那么建设这个馆呢，这个华人主题的这个馆呢，是对华人啊、呃、重建这个华人认同的一部分。那么这个哦，我想他也是展示说这个博物馆啊、呃，展示出华人怎样对印尼。啊的贡献的归属感啊，强势强调出来，所以啊，我就在这里谢谢大家。好的，呃，谢谢黄教授精彩的演讲。那么我们现在进入问答环节，呃，这边已经有了呃两道题啊，第一个是 Michael Limbo 先生哈、啊、提问的，这个应该是向郭教授哈、啊、问的哈。现在有会说普通话的年轻一代哈，但仍然懒于学习文化啊，即是歌、诗歌和用毛笔写作，如何培养这种精神？啊，郭教授可以给他们。我没没听清楚那个，他是毛毛呃，就是年轻一代的华人啊，对这个传统文化啊，他们懒得去学习，那。要怎样培养这种精神，就是爱这个传统文化的这个精神。<笑>因为这个传统传统文化呢，它实际上是需要一个过程的。呃，因为现在我们很有可能是我们在教育当中呢，把它成为了它的一种负担，它可能就没有太多的兴趣。所以我想，这个是在从呃，我今天也讲到，应该是从小孩子呃就入手，呃，形成他对。这个中华文化的这种呃奇特性感到好奇，把这个培养起来以后，随着教育再让他对中国有更中国文化、中华文化有更多的了解。呃，另外一个呢，我我我就刚才实际上已经说了这样一个意思，我们可能需要用这个印尼话，呃，来讲这个中国中华文化的故事，讲好呃是从哪里来的，哎、呃，它有什么样的。
呃、奇妙的地方，应该这样。如果是通过中文来讲，可能呢要这个这个步子啊就会很慢，因为他还他的中文他不能够这个很好的理解。包括今天咱们这个会，呃，我讲完了，我们还得再翻译一下。所以我想，如果从孩子这个角度的话，可能就得从用当地的话来先先讲，嗯，他的身份。刚才，呃，其实刚才那个王先生说的这个庙，这些庙，这些博物馆，我觉得也应该让他们去看，从小知道，接受这样的一种熏陶和教育。好，谢谢。好，谢谢郭教授啊。就是刚才还有另外一个问题，但是郭郭教授已经在聊天室那边回答了哈、啊，关于先达国语。那么现在，呃，另外一个问题是，呃，刘老师向黄教授提问的啊，就是，呃，如果英华以倾向 region base 呃 not dialect base 来表达认同，那么为何客家需要建立客家博物馆啊？有别于其他华人，客家与英华之间的身份认同有何不同？呀，呃，我、哦、谢谢这个刘老，呃，刘，呃，呃，刘老师，啊、呃，台湾的刘老师，啊、呃，其实这个问题是一个有点啊、呃、奇怪，呃，也不算是矛盾，其实就是说，当组织的时候，啊、呃，他当然还是以这个传统这个想法，就是我是客家人、闽南人等等。可是他的那个整个的这个呃过程呢，我们也了解到说，这个百家姓这一部分就是一个很重要的一个呃起点。他就是说，我们不要把这个方圆群为主。可是建设这个馆的时候，博物馆的时候，他们无形中就还是倒回这个老一套的这个呃方圆群很重要的这个代表性，所以他们还是有这个呃这一方面。可是当我们看里面呢？这个印尼博物馆呢，印尼华人博物馆里面的展示呢，它就避免了这个，或者是它很少提到这个不不同的这个方言群，反而是强调的是地缘，就是当地每个地方的这个华人的这个认同。所以他的这个身份认同呢，我们我我感觉到就是还是迈向这个，我们是印尼华人为主，这个还是比较重要的一个认同。啊，身份认同，谢谢，谢谢黄教授。那么最后一个问题啊，因为时间的关系，我看在这里有一个呃，阿提安苏利亚先生举手，是不是想跟我们呃主讲啊、呃、交流一下？阿提安苏利亚先生，你好 ，Hello， 呃 ，Mr. Adrian。OK， 那么 ，Hello，Hello，Yeah，OK，Sorry，OK，Yeah，、oh, yeah. yeah. okay, okay, okay. uh, yeah. I have to open my video. OK，OK，、okay. okay. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you.、Uh, I like to ask、uh, Prof. Wu and Mr.、Uh, Prof. Danny. Uh, uh, I'm from Surabaya, and we like to get help. For the、uh, heritage in Surabaya, so is there a body in China that can help for advising how to build up a heritage in Surabaya? We have in one street three family houses: the Han, the Tay, and the Chua. So, can can you? Uh, give us advice.、Uh, I will give my email in the chat. Thank you so much. Ah, 对，刚才阿提安先生是来自泗水啊，他想要啊问关于我们泗水有有那个建筑遗产，就是呃祠堂哈，有韩式祠堂啊，正还有另外一个是蔡蔡家祠堂哈，就是请请教一下两位两位教授哈。有什么建议能够保留哈、啊、保护这个建筑遗产？呃，我我我就讲一讲好吗？啊啊啊！所以啊，我我谢谢这个阿里安娜先生的这个问题，还有这个呃黄啊黄教授可以用英语回答吗、啊、？OK 啊、uh, ，Thank you so much for your 呃、uh, for your question 呃、uh, ，Mr. Adrian 呃、uh, ，the I think 嗯、um,。
In Indonesia itself, I think you have a lot of very good examples uh, of how some of these heritage houses were being uh, uh, preserved and so on. Just as I have mentioned, the Zhong uh, brothers uh, uh, residence in Medan. Uh, but in Malaysia, for instance, uh, we do have a very strong um, uh, inclination towards preservation of such houses, uh, especially if you have visited, say, uh, Penang, uh, Pulau Pinang. So because Penang, the part of Penang, which is the older part of Penang, Georgetown, is, a, is considered as been accepted by the UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. And indeed, we actually have a lot of Chi Tang, as these are the Kongsi, we have the Gongsi house of the Ku, the, uh, the uh, Tan, and et cetera. There were five main ones and a lot of smaller ones as well. And the big five families Gongsi house have been preserved very well with a lot of help from uh, Chinese craftsmen uh, from China because uh, quite a bit of the craft has been lost uh, locally. So we actually imported, uh, 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 get help from China as well. But uh, there were a lot of uh, references that you can actually refer to. And Malacca itself uh, also considered a UNESCO uh, heritage site. And uh, quite a few of the old houses, the Peranakan houses especially, have been preserved. So maybe these are a good example. But we, if you drop me a line, an email, I would be happy to direct you to some of these people. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Professor Danny. You're most welcome. Can I welcome. Thank you, Mr. Woody Kuniawan, and also thank you very much to our keynote speaker, Professor Ku Xi and Professor Danny Wong for the excellent session. Ladies and gentlemen, for the last session today, we would like to invite our keynote speaker and invited speaker, Dr. Todd Jen from School of Design and the Built Environment of Curtin University, Western Australia and Mr. Li Hui Han, founder and CEO of My China Roots. The session will be moderated by the lecturer of the Architectural Department, Petra Christian University, Mrs. Christine Wono Supetro. Mrs. Christine Wono Supetro, the time is yours. 女士们, 先生们, 今天的最后一场会议将由彼得拉基督教大学建筑系老师, Christine Wono Supetro老师主持。本场会议的主讲嘉宾是来自西澳科廷大学设计与建筑环境学院的托·约翰斯博士，以及中华加麦的创始人和总裁李伟汉先生。接下来的时间就交给克里斯汀·沃诺斯·布多尔老师。Okay, hello, good morning. Can everybody hear my voice? Okay, good morning. Uh, I have a technical problem, sorry. Okay. Um, okay, good morning, everybody. So for the next keynote speaker is going to be uh, presented by Dr. Todd Jones. Dr. Todd, hello, how are you? Good, thank you, thanks, Christine. Okay, so for the next about, um, uh, about 30 minutes, I think the time is yours. That the thought is being uh, uh, explained in the previous that uh, he is a 
teaching in the architecture department of a Curtin uh, Technological of University from Australia. And pleased to meet you. This is also the first time that I uh, can know you. Uh, so Dr. Todd, for the next 30 minutes, uh, the time is yours. I think you can present right now. So please. Right. Thank you very much. I'll just um, set, my, set my screen up. Is that working for everybody? Um, okay. okay, good. Excellent. So, um, so greetings to everybody from Perth, um, which is the home of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation. I just I want to start by paying my respects to their elders and also paying respect to the elders of the Chinese community of Surabaya for their wisdom and work maintaining the knowledge of their community. I'd also like to thank the organising committee, and in particular Bapak Aditya Nugraha, for this opportunity to share my research and to take part in these conversations. Today, my research is drawing from work that I've done at Adrian Pakasa, Indonesia, from Alanga University on Majba Heat heritage in East Java. So the relevance of this to a conference on Chinese heritage um, is to present a new perspective on heritage using um, this local research, this research from Surabaya and its surrounds on resident relationships with heritage. And there's, um, if you're interested, um, an early publication is, is um, up on the screen now, and um, it will be coming out on a, in a book in the next um, 12 to 18 months. So I'm gonna start this um, presentation with a, a, Odoric of Portanoni. So this, this man was a visitor in the 14th century um, to Trebulan um, at the height of the Majapahit Empire. And he described um, a palace interiors and stairs that were coated with gold and silver. And even the roof, he said, was gilded with gold. Um, and it's this kind of romantic um, representations of the Majapahit, um, along with uh, the way that its influence spread across the extent of the Indonesian nation has made it very important for, for nationalists, for nationalist history. Uh, however, while nationalists have attempted to connect the Majapahit to contemporary Indonesians, archaeologists and their institutions have historically diminished and ignored um, these connections. So for instance, the, the English governor, uh, Raffles, who undertook uh, some of the first archaeological work, uh, thought that it was Indian migrants who, who built the Majapahit uh, palaces and, and buildings, not local people. And this belief was held right through amongst some archaeologists into the 1920s. Uh, if we look at the uh, Renchana Induk Archaeology um, from 1986, they write that um, the Penduduk um, Trawalan Kurang Menghagai Peninggalan Pobakala. Contemporary academic debates into Wollan's archaeology emphasize its threatened state and focus on accurately determining the location and extent of important sites. Uh, Peter Carey, for instance, um, has written that, that within a generation, everything that now remains will have been lost. However, this focus on objects and loss misrepresents the extent to which residents both care for artifacts and pass on knowledge of sites and Majapahit archaeology. And it results in calls for state intervention and investment without adequate reflection on the effects this has on residents, including resident livelihoods. Um, and this is despite the fact that um, in the, the footnotes and, and the passing mentions in, the, in these articles, a local man, Sabah, um, comes up quite often because of his work with the, the archaeologist Henry McLean Pont um, and the way, and his relatives are still informants for recent work. So the aim of this paper is to shift Sabah and other Tualan residents from footnotes and passing mentions to the center of contemporary understandings of Majapahit artifacts. Um, recognizing resident relationships with artifacts is essential for a full and fair account and understanding of not just contemporary Majapahit heritage, but all heritage. And this is part of a broader project to build a new approach to heritage that does not marginalize residents relationships. And, and this requires a shift in how researchers conceive of heritage itself. Uh, one of the issues in heritage studies is that when um, a concept is critiqued 
and there's a kind of an antithesis between the two concepts. Instead of um, seeking a synthesis, uh, there's often often a binary results. For instance, when the nature culture uh, um, categories were critiqued, a third category comes in cultural landscapes. There's a critique of tangible heritage. The response then is intangible heritage. Um, but probably the, the most important um, uh, binary today in heritage research is between object-oriented approaches that focus on objects and how, how they can be conserved and maintained and looked after and, and interpreted and process-oriented approaches. Um, so process-oriented approaches understand heritage as a form of cultural production and communication that the process of creating heritage is political. Um, however, um, in focusing on on politics and culture, and the, um, they, they often overlook the full range of, pro, of processes that result in, um, or that need to, that are, they're involved, that interact in, in creating and, and maintaining heritage um, phenomena. So I think one of the things I, uh, me and Adrian would like to contribute is to this idea, uh, this conceptualization of heritage processes. So these are all of the processes that affect a heritage phenomenon in any way, can be wind, rain, bugs, uh, local uses, freak events, as alongside conservation techniques and spatial planning. Um, heritage phenomenon, on the other hand, are things that could appear on a heritage list or be the subject of conservation. So heritage phenomenon are always changing and are both constituted from and held together by heritage processes. So for instance, uh, my house is a heritage phenomenon. But it is what it is because of, of the, the maintenance and upkeep that I do, the cleaning of gutters and floors and repainting of walls, but also it's bound up with my, um, with my, my, own, my own history, the things that mean to me, the arrival of children, um, events, all these things are kind of come together in the heritage phenomenon. So in that way, it's constituted by the processes and there's a relationship. And this has led me to, um, uh, advocate for a new definition of heritage, that heritage is movement, all of the movements and configuration with an environment, all those forces that come together, those processes. Um, however, while this is a great book title, I hope, um, it's, um, it's, it, this could apply probably, to, it's too generalized, it applies to too many different things. So I have a, a more detailed definition um, on the back of this, which is that heritage is the movement of lives and forces that imbue phenomena with a set of characteristics and associations, some of which are strongly articulated to history and memory, which have become coupled to interactions with heritage phenomena. So they become important to its maintenance. Um, so our, this approach also requires that we reject a narrow definition of artifact as something of archeological interest. Um, so we return um, in, our, in the conclusion uh, to a rethinking of artifact that is able to cope with the diversity and complexity of their production and use by trouble well known residents. So this, I'll come back to this one. Um, so I'm not going to, there's not enough time to um, have a, a detailed history of Trawulan, which I'm sure many, many people listening would already know. But instead, I'm going to focus on um, two key um, moments in its past. One is the um, or transformations of the of the landscape of Trawulan. The first is um, the culture system of the early um, 1800s, 1800-1830. So with the introduction of um, of plantations of sugarcane, um, huge numbers of, of um, bricks were removed. And this led in a response, this often happens when heritage is lost um, to Henri McLean Pont getting money from, uh, from the plantations and the Lord, uh, the local um, ruler to, to collect artifacts. And this is what's led to the, um, the Marchapet Museum today in Trawulan. So there's, there's the first, and that's when, um, it's, that's when um, Pak Sabah began to come involved as well. Uh, the second transformation is happening at the moment. This is what um, we call the Surabaya effect or the way that the urbanization of Surabaya and surrounds um, is impacting the landscape. There's both uh, industrial level extraction, such as the digging out of entire entire rivers or streams, um, but also um, small smaller local extractions, such as the, the red brick industry, um, the uh, of the um, and 
And in, in the production of these bricks, um, there's the excavation of the, of the top one to two meters of topsoil. And as this occurs, um, the, we're seeing the, um, uh, I guess the multi-bit area structures get excavated at the same time. So you can see there's porcelain, there's bricks. And these, these um, bricks, are, the old bricks, are, are collected and they're sold for about three to four times um, uh, the price of, of a new brick. So it becomes part of this, um, this local industry. Gompertz, Hag and Carey in 2008 estimated that um, over 500 million cubic metres of soils with medieval bricks has been removed um, from the area. These large scale changes to landscape and the pressure for new factories in proximity to Surabaya are in tension with the local, national, international groups who are seeking the conservation and promotion of Marja Peep heritage. Um, so based on, on research that Adrian and I undertook in uh, 2016 and 2017, um, I'm now going to kind of turn to resident relationships with heritage. So our interviews with residents and fieldwork uh, indicates local residents have an appreciation of artefacts that is both nuanced and critical. And I want to start I guess with residents in general, before turning to uh, Trwilan artists, which are a, a special category. The primary sanction of local residents is a communal condemnation of people who sell Marja Peep artifacts to dealers who remove them from the region. Um, and uh, you can see from the quotes, um, often this, there's this, um, it's this idea of the spiritual power of, um, of artifacts to protect themselves, to make themselves um, to have agency in people's lives, to make people sick or, or family or relatives sick. Uh, for instance, there's also the belief in uh, that if a person passes through Bajang Ratul, uh, that someone will die. And the use, widespread use of gravestones on these sites. So even when residents think that the graves don't, there's no one buried there, there's still a, um, a protect, protection of the site um, just in case. Um, there's also um, local interest in, in Marjorie artifacts. This includes some personal collections of generally of, of the less valuable artifacts, such as the small statue heads you can see on the screen. Um, residents are also prepared to use state power. So there's, there's um, large fines and up to 15 years in jail time for people who are found to be um, uh, interfering with, with um, artifacts. So local, local people will, um, if they see something suspicious going on or something they don't like, um, they'll call up the police or um, a, a conservation bureau officer to come in and, and tell them off. At the same time, there's a distrust of the, of the conservation bureau uh, because of the way that when artifacts are taken to them, they tend to disappear back into the vaults and not be seen. Um, this is widespread, it's similar to um, what, we, what I've read about elsewhere in, in New England and other places. Uh, however, uh, there's also a, a wide recognition that residents had in the past sold artifacts to brokers who are likely to have sold them to overseas collectors. And there's a strong economic motive for this, um, but at the same time, it's, it's frowned upon by the local community. So there's local community sanctions too, in terms of those personal relationships about um, with, with people who want to take that kind of, those kinds of sales. Um, however, these days, uh, it's very rare now to find new, large or complete or, or expensive artifacts. In fact, when new artifacts are found, they tend to be produced by um, royal and artists. So the intimate relationship between royal and artists and Majapahit artifacts has a long and interesting history. It starts with um, with Sabah, so he started working with McLean Pont um, in the 1920, um, in 1916, sorry. Um, he was born in the 1900s in Bejijong to a farming family. He worked with McLean Pont on the uh, Paul Sarang Catholic Church in Kadiri. Um, he, so he was, he was a very good artisan himself. Uh, in 1942, when McLean Pont was interred by the Japanese and his archeological work stopped, um, Sabah then moved his own workshop to, um, to be in front of the museum and, um, and started to care for the artifacts. And the words of, um, 
his um, with Nuryadi Sabah, his his grandson. Uh, Sabah felt a moral responsibility uh, he, that he tangung uh, jawab moral um, for for the artifacts of that kind of connection to it. Um, from 1949 until his retirement in 1965, he worked in an unwaged capacity at the museum, um, earning income through commissions from visitors or for his work with the collections. Um, a few months before he retired, he was appointed to a wage position so he could get claim a pension. Um, but the story really doesn't stop with his retirement in 1965. Um, so after his retirement, he moved back to Bejijong and he started experimenting with, um, with different metalwork, making um, with the aim of producing marginal hit statues. Initially using lead and simple forms, they became more and more complex. Uh, he then started to sell his statues in front of the museum to shops in Surabaya. And his orientation through this time, because of his extensive knowledge, um, was in the style of, of the Majapahit, Heat, with the goal of replicating um, replicating their skill and their form. Uh, this this is the one statue of um, Laksaba that that's about around at the moment, and a self portrait of his of his own head. And this is owned by his son Hariyadi Saba, um, is now you know, a nationally prominent um, bronze sculpture. So Sabat didn't just teach his sons though, Sabat taught um, neighbors, friends, relatives. Um, and and this, this skill, this skill set spread out across um, Krawulan. Today, um, according to Hariadi, over 150 people in Bejijong work in some capacity in the production of metal statues, jewelry, and other objects. Um, so there's the bronze work, but there's also um, there's also the terracotta work. I'm not going to talk so much about this. Terracotta, um, it tends to be um, less, it's uh, it's easier to reproduce and um, tends not to have, um, tends to be probably cheaper, not as profitable. Um, but where, where things have really exploded is in stone production. The stone production began in 1977 with the work of a blacksmith, Harun, and then another blacksmith, Wagiran, in the nearby village of Jasisumba. So with the decline of blacksmithing work, um, Harun and Wagiran turned to stone sculpture. And most of the stone sculptors today can trace their lineage back to these two founders. Wagiran was the father of Wakiri, who taught many sculptors in Jati Sumba, including the internationally successful um, Ribut. It's now a successful um, exporting business, 75% of production um, being for an international market. Presence of the museum and sites of the artifacts is essential to the emergence forms and operations of the new Majapahit art. Uh, began with Sabah's no, knowledge and orientation. So Sabah and the other early, early artists um, without the internet or, uh, or much else, they would go to the museum or to sites to look at what was there and to study it. It was the only reference point for these people. Uh, both Hariadi and Ribut um, still visit the museum weekly and make regular visits to sites both inside and outside Trawulan. Um, so there's this, the presence of these, the museum, the, like, keeping them in the area is, a, is it's an essential part of the emergence of, of, of this skill set. Uh, despite these relationships, artists have said to me that they're uncomfortable in the museum due to accusations of copying. Uh, Martin Pitt's stone sculpture in particular has reached a level of technical production that, uh, with contemporary techniques for aging, make it very difficult to know if an artifact is new or from the Majapahit era. Furthermore, the museum now asks senior artists to actually come in and make the determinations if it's new or not. They're the ones who know the most. Um, in its function, the Majapahit um, art in, it's, is like a traditional or Seni Tradisi, a traditional arts and crafts industry. There's no copyright, little branding, and disagreements tend to be sorted out within the community. Uh, there are apprenticeships from within uh, between five to 10 years. And the villages and genealogies of different families determine the geography of the Majapit art, of that kind of passing down through, these, through the generations. There's a known canon uh, to draw on and, and the peak 
production, the, the kind of that top level is uh, is the um, is the margin heat style. Um, it's getting close to what's what's being produced during the margin heat era. Um, so if we turn to representations um, in, internationally of the art, uh, when I took this the information, some of these pictures um, to a museum in New York, for instance, um, um, I thought they'd be welcoming of the return of this skill set and these, um, uh, you know, this new un this understanding that's developing in this, at the local level in Trawulan. Uh, but instead, of, what I found was that there was a real concern over the provenance of the museum collections. They were worried that um, they were going to have to deal with all, all of these, these new objects being produced. So, and that, that was a real real um, concern for me as, as a researcher and someone who has relationships in Trawulan. Um, And, and I really want to push back on, on the, these accusations of, of copying, this, this um, notion that copying is not, that it's not skilled or creative, or, or even that, that that's really what they're doing. And I'm going to do this um, through this quote by Tim Ingold. So Ingold writes that through repetitive practice and copying or imitating previous or classic exemplars, novices incorporate the movements and sensibilities of the masters into their own bodily comportment, only to surpass them in the development of their own personal style. At no point, however, do they cease to copy. For every original is a copy that is modeled on previous studies. And every copy is an original in that it can become a model for those that follow. So the replication of, of art, being able to understand these movements, the movements of which stones to move in, but then how, how to shape the stone and what, what the, um, uh, to, bring, to bring together um, these movements is a, a remarkable achievement. To all an artist, understand the process of creating multiple artifacts better than anybody. And so while the, and this isn't just occurring in Tuolan, uh, we can see it in um, places like Magellan, uh, but also overseas in, in Italy and Peru. While recent archaeological research is rigorous and important, its archaeological and historical framing limits its capacity to appreciate resonance entanglements, their, their relationships with Majapit artifacts. And I want to come back to the definition of an artifact here. So the first, the first definition here is artifacts as objects. Um, and this, these are um, kind of the, the definition which tends to dominate um, popularly. Um, so artifacts as objects are also effects of the colonial and post-colonial production of history that creates a valued past and more insidiously contemporary um, holds up these contemporary regimes of value in museums and galleries. Of course, things are never shaped just by, by humans or by man as the original quote had it, but are the product of environments where skilled, where humans are one of many forces engaging materials and surfaces. Artists skilled interaction with stones shaped statues then the statues are worked on by wind, rain, lichen, animals, soil, restorers, and so on. If we look at the second definition, um, an artifact is being man-made, uh, such as a spurious experimental result. It, it kind of, that gets closer to the, uh, um, the, the concept that particular sets of relationships um, produce artifacts. It's not just a, a person doing it, a, a, a master or, or an artist, but it's, that, it's actually a range of things coming together. So that's better because it opens it up to resonance activities and practices. But um, where I got, I got most excited, I think, by this is, the, is actually in the etymology or the, the root words through which artifact come together. And this is from arte factum, uh, from ars skill and facere to make. So artifacts then are skilled making. In the original meaning, an artifact was then an act of movement rather than an object. It was the skilled making. If heritage is the relationships between phenomena and environments that draws from or expounds on a valued past, then there's actually an argument to be made for the equivalence of the new Majapi art with, um, uh, with the original artifacts, the, the artifacts that were produced um, in the 14th century. 
If we recognize to and artists' skills and practice as heritage, some would say intangible cultural heritage, then we're left with the question of why the products of their skill are not also designated as heritage. So now I'm going to kind of point to three correspondences between it. The first is this one between um, the new and the, the new Majapit art and the 14th century Majapit art. And, um, um, and the way, the way that, um, that they are in some, in some cases actually impossible to tell apart. A second correspondence is between uh, the skills of the artists and the skills of archaeologists and conservators. Heritage experts are just uh, one set of, of skilled interactions with environments that produce artifacts. So uh, these are important for heritage studies as heritage conservation can be, can be represented as um, keeping objects the same when it is really like the creation of a new piece of Majmeet art, a skilled process of controlling material flows. It's about, um, and while archeologists spend five to 10 years studying to recognize and understand the shape and material composition of artifacts, Trabul and artists spend the same length of time or a similar length of time learning from knowledge generated and held within their community, learning about materials and tools to, um, and those movements to generate them. Uh, the third correspondence is between knowledge, that the archaeological knowledge and, arch and artist knowledge. So, and there's strong cases for, strong case I think, for artists and archaeologists to talk about the manufacture of these artifacts and the the, um, in particular, things like the, the stone that it comes from and, and how these things happen. Okay, I think the time is almost up. Dr. Right, okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll just finish up now then. Okay, thank you very much for oh, your no, presentation. No, no, think, sorry, uh, sorry. I'll just sorry. I'll quickly finish now. Thank oh, you. Okay, 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 please. Yeah. I'm sorry. No problems. Um, so we just um, scratching the surface here of recent relationships with artifacts and how this raises um, issues with um, in, in heritage management. So I think the privileging of past is, of this past historical period over the contemporary moment um, is the way that it allows archaeologists and others to make ambit claims for exclusive land use and access that ignore contemporary and ongoing relationships with those environments. So. A quote from um, Chris Hagen Carey is that the implementation of a robust regime of archaeological site preservation is imperative to ensure that future generations of archaeologists are not deprived of access to the glory that was pre-colonial Java. It ignores the way that that um, artists and residents um, way they're using this access and the importance of this access to to what they do and what they're about. And I think we need we need to address this through through a reconceptualization of what heritage is. We need to broaden out. Um, what we think of as heritage management. Um, and we, we can do that by including all of the way that the forces that, um, that shape heritage are addressed. If we're not gonna endlessly repeat this problem of exclusion, this narrow focus on particular times and particular groups of people, rather than a, a broader and more embracing and, um, set of relationships um, that can lead to, to more, um, I think to more collaborations, to, to broader influences and to, to more engagement. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Jones, for uh, such a nice uh, presentation. It's actually uh, bring us to a uh, new perspective to how actually we can see the um, interaction between the nature, culture, and cultural, and also how to preserve the uh, heritage and also the artifacts as um, bring it bring into the new uh new 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 terms and new forms so how it is being in, uh, inherited to the new generations thank you very much so next i think uh, we just go to uh move forward to the next uh speakers our next keynote speakers is um going to be presented by mr lee we han uh good morning mr lee Morning. Is it, am, am I right? Uh, right, uh, reading your name, <laughs> Li Hui Han. Um, yes. actually, you are the uh, maybe you're the founder of my China, China Roots Uh, Mr. Li is also uh, studied in the Columbian University, he takes undergraduate course 
uh, in New York City and also continued to study in Master in International Law from the University of Amsterdam. And right now, um, Dr. Uh, Mr. Lee is um, being the founder of My Chinese, uh, My Chinese Root and also helps overseas Chinese to trace the ancestries and connect it with their roots. Is it right? Okay, That's right. what a very interesting uh, profession. So Mr. Lee, I think next you can share with us about your presentation. Uh, the next 30 minutes, the time is yours. Okay, please. Sure. Well, thank you, Christine, and thank you, first of all, for, to Petra University and for the whole uh, marvelous organization uh, team. It's really a pleasure and a privilege to be with you all. So uh, nice to meet you all. My name is Hui Han. As Christine mentioned, I run a company called My China Roots. And maybe um, I should just start with a couple of words of introduction about myself, because my own background is directly tied to My China Roots and what we do today. So I was born and raised in the Netherlands, in Holland. Uh, my parents were born in, in, in Indonesia. My father's Surabaya, my mother Jakarta. And six generations ago, my family came from, from Southern Fujian, from their Hokkien. So I grew up um, going to Indonesia every, roughly every summer, uh, loving it, loving story, to hear stories about Indonesia, about Indonesia. Um, when, for instance, my grandfather was a child, uh, him playing on the sugar, sugar plantations, etc. Father, my my father, who would tell me stories, um, and one particular memory is still stuck in my mind. I, I think I was I was probably about six or seven years old, <clears throat> and I remember a conversation. I don't know who between, but it was about Chinese Indonesians and. And there was something, somebody said, well, yeah, but that person is not Chinese or maybe he is Chinese, I don't remember. All I remember is me thinking, oh, but we're in Indonesia and everybody's Indonesian. So Chinese, what does that, what does a Chinese Indonesian mean? And, and um, how does that work? And then of course I, you know, I got told, or at least I knew, you know, we were Indonesian, but, but then my thoughts were, okay, so we live in Holland. Apparently not everybody in Indonesia is Indonesian. There are also Chinese Indonesians and non-Chinese Indonesians. What does it all mean? How does it all fit together? And how did we end up in Holland? Why don't we know anybody in China? Why don't we speak Chinese? Um, how does this all work? So, you know, I got a lot of questions and they were only partly answerable by my, by my family because my family had left China so long ago. So I guess, while I was in my teens, my curiosity about China grew, but there was also a trepidation that went along with it because I didn't speak any Chinese and I figured, well, if I go, I want to, I don't want to just see the Great Wall and go, then go back to, to Holland. I want to really be there. And that means speaking the language. I already felt embarrassed enough coming to, uh, going to Chinatown in Amsterdam, uh, having a waiter speak Chinese to me and me not able to speak back. Uh, or me, I also remember asking for a fork and a spoon in, in a Chinese restaurant once and I got the ugliest look ever and I'll just never forever forget that and you know the waiter told me well if you're Chinese you need to eat with chopstick. So as a child of course that you know those experiences accumulate and I figured okay I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna go and it was after my studies um, so a, a law degree where I figured okay uh, now is the time. If I ever want to go, now is the time because otherwise, if I apply for jobs in, in Holland or in the West, it will just be more difficult to just really go to China. So I, I went to China uh, mostly because of curiosity. I thought, let's stay for half a year. And if I don't like it, I'll come back. What's the worst that can happen? Let's just study Chinese and see what it's like. So that was in 2004. And along the way, I was working in, in business strategy consulting. Uh, studying Chinese and digging into my family roots as a hobby. Now that started as uh, a lot of a lot of Chinese Indonesians would start their root search with the tombstone of my of my great grandfather, and I'll show you. Some, so the tombstone is on, on the bottom uh, right. My great grandfather is just right next to that tombstone picture of my great grandmother, and then you know going to the left is my grandparents, and then further to the left is my my parents. Um, on the top is me with my grandfather. So basically I started digging into our family history in China, um, traveling to our ancestral places. Only uh, then I discovered, or at least I, I discovered in my mid twenties after having seen my great grandfather's tombstone, which is in, in Eastern Java, like a hundred times, 
only later I realized, okay, so there's actually a hint of uh, our ancestral place at the top two characters of the tombstone. Um, so that's, those were the clues that I started off with. And the, those are the clues that enabled me to dig into where in China do, do the, does that place uh, correspond to, traveled there. And of course, it, uh, it led to a lot of findings, which uh, to my surprise, were really emotional and psychological in their depth and breadth. And they, they really um, made me feel, discover things that I didn't, didn't know before. And the more I shared my story with other people, the more I got asked to help them. So that's why, that's when the idea of My China Roots came in. And that's when in 2012, I decided to quit my um, cushy expat job and do My China Roots full time. So since 2012, <clears throat> we've been, we have a, a team of today, six, seven full-time researchers and a whole group of part-time researchers that do very hands-on research work and uh, translation work and, and um, contextualization work. And uh, to a large extent, that work consists of finding out which villages uh, families were from originally in China, because contrary to how it, Genealogy typically works in the West where you have central authorities like church and state related authorities that have records and maintain those records. In the Chinese context, it all goes back to the clan and the families and the records, the traces are still um, typically maintained by clans and families and clans and families, the core of where they are geographically is in the ancestral village, which for the majority uh, of overseas Chinese or, or people of uh, Chinese descent who were born outside China, which in the majority is southern Fujian and certain areas in Guangdong and so on in southern China. So our special, uh, speciality of our custom researches is to go to those places, to, the ancestral villages, to conduct interviews, record interviews, to document all the traces, take pictures, 360 footage of the, of the, of the village environment, and of course then relay that information in a way that it is relatable to the often non-Chinese speaking customers that we have. So the bigger reason why I'm here today is because we this year we are launching an online platform. So the, the, what I just mentioned is very custom, uh, customized. It's very manual labor and research. Now what the goal has always been to really uh, reach as many people as possible of the Chinese diaspora and to really empower the many millions of people with Chinese heritage to, in, in any case, start their research themselves. And um, just the same way it, it took me about five years to really uh, get a lot of the information about different branches of my, my family history, this online platform, so an online database that will be searchable especially by people who don't or are not very good at reading Chinese. Um, that's now the goal for those people to be able to do it in a couple of minutes. And I will show you in a couple of minutes from now how to, how to do that. Maybe one quick uh, remark about the type of source material that we are focusing on. Um, Right now, our key focus is what is sometimes referred to as the holy grail in Chinese genealogy. Uh, in Mandarin, it's called a zupu or a jiapu. Um, literally translated, that would be a clan book or a family book. <clears throat> and these books, they can, they can literally be volumes of books, 12 volumes, each with a couple of hundred pages, with, with tens and tens of thousands of names in the family tree with ancestral biographies, with migration history in China, with information about where people migrated to when they left China, with uh, guidelines on what uh, sort of commandments for the clan, if you will, that would, that would really correlate to the identity of that clan, gravestones where those were, uh, were laid out in court, according to Feng Shui. So basically these are encycl encyclopedias for clan histories. And uh, we, again, they were mostly maintained by clans themselves, by families themselves. And we, this year we are, we, we have been focusing on these books and uh, going forward, we will expand that database with county gazetteers, with tombstone, with tombstones, with altar tablets, remittance letters, etc. But uh, for now, let's uh, do a little demo. 
while I set up, uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to just ask. Do you need help? Okay. Yes. Okay. I think you can see my browser. Yeah, I think right? it's working. Good. All right. Let's um, let's dive in. So this is this is our, our site. So basically, if you go to my chat mychannelwoods.com here's the url You're, this is this is our home page uh, where i am now going is uh, surnames and what i'd like to do is take two scenarios I'll, I'll take two fictional people users one that has quite a bit of information and about their family history and one that really doesn't and let's just start with the one that has very little information um, let's call him Ronnie Wijaya, and let's you know he's from Indonesia, and he's interested in his roots. He doesn't he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know what his uh, migrating ancestor was called. He knows or he's heard the names Fukien and and Amoy, but that's that's the extent to which he's basically been um, been told anything about their history. But that, so that's what he, he knows. Now for Ronnie, the the first. As for anybody who wants to learn more about their, their Chinese roots, um, you need to go to, through to the characters and you need to start with your surname. I, I already explained the, the importance of clans and surnames of families. So in this case, it's, it's Vijaya. Vijaya is obviously not a Chinese, Chinese um, name, but nevertheless, he puts that into the search um, box. So our, our system then leads him to basically a quick overview of well, Vijaya as a last name, some quick facts. Um, and then most importantly, because it's Ronnie's goal to get to the character, what, what was the character that later on became Vijaya? And um, there are a couple of, because um, of course, I, I'm sure as every, Everybody on, on this call knows a lot of the, ch the Chinese words were Indonesianified uh, when, you know, when uh, in the Suharto era. And uh, if you boil it down, there are basically two characters that throughout history have been Romanized into the, the name Vijaya. So there's uh, in Mandarin Huang and there's in Mandarin Wei. So for Ronnie, is now the task okay, how do I know which one it is? So he would click on both. He can see, he can read some information about the meaning, about the history of, in this case, the surname Wei in Mandarin. Um, most you know, some information about where the key locations is in Guangdong and Fujian, where those Wei's are, are from. Um, importantly though, most importantly for Rami, is that he needs to, he can see from this list of other surnames, there are other sort of, uh, these are Wei versions of the Wijaya surname. Way variations of the Vijaya surname. You can see, okay, do, do any of these surnames look familiar? Do I know anybody that is close to my family that it has these surnames? Mm, not really. Then in which case he should go to the other character, Huang. And he does the same thing and he looks at the surnames and he, say, he says, oh, Hui. Okay, wait, Hui. I actually have some distant relatives and, and, and they, they're using the surname Hui. Now, so that is a clear clue that they have the same uh, root, which in this case is the character in Mandarin pronounced as Huang. So then the next step for Ronnie is to, well, he can, he can either go and, and explore, learn a bit more about the, the Huang surname, but he can also just go uh, further his research and see, okay, what uh, Huang plan books does this My China Roots have in its database? So he clicked on, um, that link and he sees, okay, there are 343 clan books. And each clan book has many tens of thousands of names. So that's, that's a lot of information. This is way too much. He can't possibly go through that whole list. So then he filters it down. Um, as I mentioned, what he's heard is uh, Fukien, Hokien, like he's heard about that, but he doesn't really know what it is. So he, he puts in F-U-K-I-E-N. And our system will then see, okay, Fujian is actually a province, which in Mandarin today, it's, it's uh, in Pinyin, it's spelled uh, Fujian, F-U-J-I-A-N. And there, if you feel this is that, 
okay, the, it's still, it's, it's a lower number of family trees in our database, but it's still 202, too much. Okay, so then he thinks, well, what's another name? Amoy. Now, Amoy is, is, is a name that isn't being used at all anymore. And it's actually, um, today it's, it's known as a Xiamen. But again, our database will then help recognize, okay, Amoy, that's actually another, that's a city called Xiamen today. So this then, because it's not a province, Fujian, but it's a city, so it's already smaller, it filtered down the results to 10 results. So now Ronnie has a chance, uh, the, the choice between 10 books. So what he can do now is he can, he can view the record, he can view these books, but because he doesn't really know anything more, he can, he can, he can browse inside these books. Um, but because he doesn't really know any Chinese, um, it's of limited use. I mean, maybe you'll get a, a bit of a kick out of looking at these old Chinese clan books, but that it'll probably be over quite soon, his fascination. So what I would recommend Ronnie does is basically save, save these clan books that might possibly be his. And then in the meantime, build up other information that his family has. And he can do that by uh, adding information, by building a family tree on the platform or uh, adding pictures. So basically family tree is, is quite straightforward. You can just, um, you know, you have profiles and where our family tree software is different is that it is specifically made for Chinese names. So if you wanna add a relative, you can, you can basically, um, you can choose between different uh, you know, Chinese name and is it a first name or a generation name or a nickname, paper name. These are all very specific to Chinese history. Um, so he can build the family tree or he can uh, add pictures to his library, uh, like tombstones. And why does he want to do this? The reason why is because if he builds, uh, if he adds names to the family tree, we will, our system will check immediately if we have those names in clan books that we uh, already have digitized. If he has in his library a picture of a tombstone, but he doesn't know what it is, he can then use, he can then very easily share the link with his aunt or his uncle who, who speak a little bit Chinese or who know what is on the tombstone. And they can then basically together add uh, information on, about what is on the tombstone. So basically who is the people who are on it, the, the, uh, sorry, the, the time that it is, uh, the times that are listed on, on, the, uh, on the tombstone, uh, where he was buried, etc. And the more information Ronnie can gather from his family, the more he can collaborate with aunts and uncles to figure out who was on what picture, second to the right, uh, second row, or on the tombstone, the more we can then check with our system to see, okay, do we have that person in a clan book? So, so that's Ronnie. Um, let's move to another another fictional person who has a little bit more information about their about their roots. Um, sorry, Time is almost up, sir. I'm sorry. Just a gentle reminder for you. Sure. Okay. So <laughs> then for that, that's fine. That's fine. So uh, let's take an example of um, uh, Lisa Lisa Tan. So her name is Lisa Tan, and she has she has a tombstone, right? So she has a tombstone that has information, the Chinese name of the of the migrating ancestor and the place that she's from. So what she can do here is if she her name is Tan. So basically, our and let's uh, let's just. So let's assume that this is the name on the tombstone of the migrating ancestor. She can just directly search for an ancestor name. Now, our system will then go through the 20,000 clan books that we have and basically look through all those millions of names and see if there's a in Mandarin, Chen Mingguang. So 73 results, which is, which is, which is a lot. So then Lisa now needs to... Um, filter it down by place, ancestral place, which is also, again, often mentioned in uh, on the tombstone. So now there are only three results. Uh, now she can see, okay, these are where this name appears on the thumbnails. However, this one, this picture doesn't look uh, very logical because you can see that these two characters don't, they don't actually uh, match, they don't form one name. Whereas on this 
picture you can see me wrong, those two characters, they actually form a name. So she clicks on this and And yippee 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 yay, uh, she finds the clan book that actually lists the, the name of her great grandfather in this case. So our system has uh, optical character recognition technology, which means that she can basically hover over any character and you can see at the bottom of the screen, the transliteration and the, transli uh, the translation of each of those characters. So this will help her basically translate if she then wants to um, see like a text heavy page where her great grandfather's name appears, she can click on, uh, for instance, on this button, OCR, and it will have the whole, the whole page. So she can copy paste it into Google. Um, so basically this is how she can um, make her way, navigate her way through her, the Chinese part of her history. Now the very final thing then, just one and a half minutes more is basically what can you do with all this information? Um, well, with this information from clan books, and especially if you link it to other sources like uh, County Gazetteers and other types of source materials, you can, uh, if you put it all together, if you add, if you combine the personal history with the regional history, you can make very in-depth chronologies, uh, which is what we do uh, and what our platform will allow users to do themselves. So basically you can build a migration within, you know, a timeline within China on the left hand, here you see a 16 year, 1600 year long chronology of, in this case, a, a particular Zhang, Zhang clan from, from, from Guangdong, starting with the first ancestor. And um, here what we, what, it, what we do and what the system does is really try to bring history alive by combining, again, regional with personal history. So it contextualizes the information that is found in a Zhongbu. So Sui Dynasty, what was happening in China at the moment, and every, uh, so basically along the ancestors, uh, the lineage, we discuss Chinese history. And it goes by dynasty, by century, you can move forward. And every, everything in here is Emperor Kangxi's great clearance, all the way up to today. So um, this is one thing. Uh, to do basically, especially for, for preservation, for making history come alive, for transferring it to your kids. Uh, we have a lot, of, we work a lot with YouTube clips and, and music videos on what today, the relevance today, and we, we put that in these sites too. Um, secondly, find, there's another type of site that we also do for people, and that is the ancestral village today. So when we visited the village, either with or without uh, the, the customer, we make we put the information that we gather in these sites. So it just has basic information, but then most importantly, information about the village today. So uh, just factual information, the address in English and in Chinese, uh, names in English and Chinese, pictures of the environment with commentary, <clears throat> what it looks like, what's still there. And then importantly, if there's, for instance, still an ancestral house where your great grandfather was born. Uh, we we visited. We write up all the relevant, you know, what room was used for what, who lives there now, what's the situation. And now we're experimenting more and more with 360 footage and videos to actually and live streaming too. So if you have an ancestral village, we can just we get on a bus. One of our researchers get on the bus, takes their iPhone, walks through the village, and actually literally walks you around the village that 200 years ago your great-grandfather would have would have walked through okay i think um yeah that's largely it if anybody has any questions or maybe uh, uh, christine how do you want to take this okay okay is it done <laughs> well, I was told that I, I, I was uh, I was almost done. So I'm I'm. Uh, let's consider myself done. Yeah. I think it's a very interesting presentation. I think wow, this is very amazing, and I think it's going to be uh, very helpful for uh, many many researchers around the world to what is it to, so. to assess this uh, website. Very interesting, Vivian. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can think I, yes. Can I can I ask Rihanna a question, please? 
Yeah, after this, I think we're going to question and answer sessions. Okay, Vihan, okay. can can I uh, end yeah. your session? Because I, I saw that there is a lot of participants who is not really uh, uh, very patient to wait for doing a question and answer sessions. Uh, so I think uh, both of the keynote speaker have already presented a very great information to us. And I think that... Uh, I saw, wow, there is a lot of questions. Okay, the first questions I think is going to Dr. Todd. Dr. Todd, uh, these questions are for you. Um, from Freddie Hendrawan, does the local government provide a number of incentives for the local people or communities who found the artifacts by themselves or within the residential area? I think this, this is about the Majapahit, I think. And as I found this kind of incentive, some money is provided by the solo government in Central Java as a part of the preservation and conservation methods. It might be relating to the social politics and social economic aspect. What do you think about that, Dr. Todd? Okay. Thank, thanks for that question. Yeah, it's something I, I, I cut out due to the length of time, but you're right, it, there is payments back. There's some really interesting relationships there that uh, for one thing, um, a number of residents say in Trawalan will work in the um, uh, the uh, Bape Chabe. Um, uh, so there's there's that overlap, and there's and then there's the the positions of the Jeru Pilihara, you know, the caretakers, and of, many of them are are paid part time by the by the government. So there's this cons there is a lot of flows into the local economy and society. And a recognition of of, um, of of some of those those roles, um, and it's it's quite interesting to be there to see. You can see the the reconstructed sites and the, the big. And this is something else we've, we've Adrian and me have written about those large reconstructed sites and how they operate in terms of large numbers going through. And then there's the smaller um, the smaller sites uh, which which tend to be more used in line with the the Javanese calendar um, and, and are regulated in very different ways. So yeah, it's it's quite. It's quite a complex set of arrangements and lots of overlaps between. Okay, thank you very much. And the second is uh, came from our dean. Okay, from uh, Dr. Dwi Setiawan, Dr. Todd Jones. Did you find any marked Chinese influence on Majapahit artifacts, considering the uh, long conflicts between the two powers? And the second question: Did you see any relation between the current rise of the formal Islam? along with its uh, iconoclasm, belief, and the general neglect of Majapahit artifacts. How about this? Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm probably not the, the best qualified person to com comment on the um, on the extent of those those uh, those interactions. Certainly it's something, there's a long record of, of trade and certainly there's a lot of um, lot of porcelain which shows the extent of, of the um, of the interactions between the Majapahit and and China, um, so they're certainly there. Uh, not um, and then there's there's no that that's the subject. The the presence of Islam in the Majapahit is a subject of a long, long um, set of debate, ongoing debate uh, around around at what time Islam was was in East Java. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the um, certainly there's a very strong Islamic influence on on how the sites are used now. If we if we, if we go um, into uh, we go to a, a site on a um, is it um, uh, you know on, on the right on the on a Thursday night Malam Jumat, um, you know you've always, there'll always be a number of Islamic people yes, coming, Javanese Islam will come in and they'll go there and spend a long time at, at various sites. Um, and then there's the um, uh, the grave site of the um, that's in control line of um, the, um, uh, you know, of one of an old grave site, Islamic grave site. And that gets, and that, that now has a street, there's um, a street full of um, activities every Malam Jumat Legi um, with huge numbers of people coming in. So there's, there's an interesting, you know, certainly contemporary relationships I can comment on is that there's a very strong set of relations there where the Majapahit have been incorporated into, um, you know, contemporary local practices and in, um, including the kind of Islamic practices through around Java. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ta. And I think the next question is going to uh, Huihan. 
Okay, Wihan, there is a lot of appreciation to your through your work. Uh, thanks to my China, China roots, now we can create our family tree. Jupu, but we still have some technical problems to transfer language from Indonesian to Chinese. So we need some support from, from Petra, <laughs> actually. Uh, thank you very much. Best regard, RHC partnership. Okay, thank you for the compliments. And then I heard that there is a, from Philip Tan, Wihan would be sending someone to my house in Kuala Lumpur to scan my collection of about 300 ancestral books. So this is from a participant. I think uh, Philip Tan, I saw just now. Uh, hello. Philip. Yes, can, can, can I ask oh, Wihan a question? Uh, yeah, Philip Tan here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you uh, want hi. to, yes. Yeah, please, we please. had I understand my China roots is, is is having a website where we can put in our family trees and input our family trees. Could you tell us something about that, uh, we had? Yes. So I, I briefly showed the family tree, so you can input family trees manually. Mm -hmm. What we are now working on is if you already have your family tree in, for instance, genie.com or myheritage or ancestry.com, you'll be able to export the JetCom files from there and import it onto ours pretty soon. Uh, so we're working on that right now. And then the, the even larger step, which will, which will come next year, because that's a very large step, is basically where we have all the, um, basically the family trees from the Zulpus that we automatically extract the relationships of. And those will then be automatically turned into essentially a world Chinese diaspora family tree uh, after they've been connected. So the uh, family tree software is at the core of what we do. That's uh, it's completely correct. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I I saw that there is someone who going to maybe directly uh, give in the questions. Is anyone want to give questions, please? And uh, Bu Elisa, could you help me? Because I saw that there is a person who maybe write the question. Maybe, I don't know either this is a question or not because the, the, the writing is in Mandarin. Maybe you can help me to translate it. Yes, because okay. Also, also <laughs> in, in, I'm so sorry, Elisa. Yeah. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, yeah, there's a, a note from Zhang Yi Hong, uh, Zhang Hong Yi Xian Sen, uh, Zhang Hong Yi Lao Shi. Uh, he is from Medan, he's from Mianlan. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he wrote here is, Hen Gao Xing Ting Dao Li Wei Han Xian Sen Yan Jiang, Hu Guo Wo Zi Neng Su Xie Han Zi Jiao Liu, Xie Xie Nin Le. 你的视频下南洋给我带来启发 uh, Very happy to hear the speech from Mr. Li Wei Han uh, But he can only write in Hanzi uh, to have the dialogue And he said that he's uh, very appreciate the, the Maybe the video clip or something 下南洋 It was a, sorry, it was a uh, documentary Documentary? Yeah, yeah. Uh, documentary video, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, it, it, I think it came out. Oh dear, uh, nine years ago or so. Uh, about yeah, about overseas Chinese who went to Southeast Asia and the history. Okay. And it's, yeah, it's it's only, south the, only a note south of the from ocean. Uh, Zhang Hongyi Lao Okay. Mm. Uh, thank you. Xie. I'm very happy to see you again, Mr. Li. <laughs> Same here. Okay. Thank you, Elisa. I'm so sorry. I okay. just got a well, problem. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. okay. No problem. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, can I continue? Okay. Yes, of course. Uh, 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 another, another one who wants to directly uh, ask for questions. Uh, is there anyone here? Uh, uh, Mr. Crisanto, I think there's a question for Mr. Li Wei Han. Wait, Mr. Okay, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Crisanto. Mr. Crisanto. Crisanto. Asking okay. about do you also provide it with a DNA test? Okay. Ah. Hmm. Okay, please. The short answer is yes, we can help with DNA tests. Uh, the longer test, uh, longer answer is uh, we're not doing our own DNA tests at the moment. So we're, at the moment, we would still facilitate rather than. Uh, we don't have our own laboratories yet, but we are talking with lab laboratories uh, on setting up a DNA database. At the moment, it's still 
for roots tracing, it's still the best if we first have an ancestral village that we have strong suspicion that you would be from, and then we do mouth swaps to compare the mm. DNA. And then we can really know. If we do a, just a unilateral DNA swap, you'll probably get like, I don't know, nine, like I did five tests as a, as, a, as a test of four tests, and I got 90% like Chinese, and then the rest is sort of useless. It was all different. So point there being is that the data sets aren't big enough for Chinese in general to say something really conclusive and useful about your ethnic uh, her, um, uh, background uh, if it's just if it's just your DNA. Okay, I hope thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Vihan. Okay, I think uh, because of the limitation of time, I think I'm so sorry for the other participants who still want to or still have a questions. Maybe you can uh, just uh, pass it through the committee. Maybe the committee can uh, give it to the both of the keynote speakers, and they can maybe. Uh, uh, what answer the question later okay for the final remarks uh and maybe there is uh still uh another uh what is it a final uh sentence from both of the keynote speaker from dot dot is there still any a uh, closing sentence from you no um i'll just say uh, look um i think it's fantastic to be in an international conference where where we're speaking across Across different languages, um, and um, and I've just it's been very. I just probably just say my thanks for, for the invitation and the opportunity to hear the other speakers as well. So thank you very much. Yeah. It's nice to uh, know you also, Dr. Thought. Thank you very much, and I hope that we can still have a, a contact in the future. And from uh, Hui Han, do you still have another closing sentence, please? Mostly to thank the organizing team. Uh, thank you so much for putting this together. It's been wonderful. Um, I, f I would love to speak to everybody that is actually on on the on the Zoom call with the hundred plus people because I'd love to hear their stories, and I'm sure that they have useful information much more than I do. But um, no, I'll just stop there. Thanks for the for organizing it. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe from me uh, for the closing. Uh conclusion for the sessions is I like to write about the uh, quotations about the heritage from Khalil Gibran. Khalil Gibran said that he who denies his heritage has no heritage. And this session is mostly talking about our heritage and our roots. And we all know how important is our, our roots and our heritage in our life. Now the big problems and big uh, homework for all of us is actually how is it going to be preserved or how it is going to be best for the younger generations. Okay, thank you very much for the both keynote speaker. I think it's time for us to give a big applause for the keynote speaker for this session. And I would like to give back uh, this uh, session to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Christine wono -Saputo. And also thank you very much to our keynote and invited speaker, Dr. Todd Jones and Mr. Lee Hui Han for the Israel presentation. So uh, if I may conclude, artifacts as part of cultural heritage and an amazing work done by Mr. Lee Hui Han as a way to preserve our cultural heritage. Thank you, Christine Wonosopro, Lao Shi. Also thank you, our guest, Todd Jones, Bo Shi, and Lee Hui Han, for giving us the presentation. 文物是我們文化遺產的一部分。感謝李偉漢先生保護了我們寶貴的文化遺產。Ladies and gentlemen, after this, we're going to have a 30 minutes break before we come to the parallel session. So our parallel session will start at 1 p.m. Uh, Surabayan time and will end at 2.30 p.m. There are seven rooms, so a part of the rooms. Please feel free as well to start networking. Uh, the first room is Culture One, moderated by Dr. Ribut Basuki, MA, and Culture Two, moderated by Mr. Stefano Supriatno, MA, PhD. Uh, room Three, Culture Three, moderated by Dr. Lim Satyalimanta, MA. Culture Four, moderated by Aditya Nugraha, and Culture Five, moderated by Professor Esther Harianti Kunchara. MA PhD and Architecture One, moderated by Christine Wonosaputo, 
STMASD, and Lost Architecture 2, moderated by Ruli Damayanti, STMART PhD. Nishuman,先生,在这之后,我们将会有三十分钟的休息时间。休息回来之后,我们将会开始我们的分组讨论会。分组讨论会将于一点下午开始。总共我们有七个讨论室。然后我们两点三十分下午结束。have a nice break and please make sure to come back at 12.50 Surabaya time, 10 minutes before the panel session starts. Thank you. 来宾们请务必在十二点五十分分组讨论会开始的前十分钟回到 Ahem. <clears throat>